Good evening. What a beautiful day that the Lord has given us. I am so thankful to see each and every one of you here this evening. And I would like to first of all acknowledge my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to pray and I want us to acknowledge Him and I believe that without Him everything is vain. If we're going to save the nation, we need the Lord. So let's ask for His help. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the day you've given us, for the beautiful country that has been given to us by those who paid a very high price for our freedoms and liberty. We're so thankful to meet in a, a house dedicated to the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for these patriotic friends who love you and love country, maybe more than life. And Lord, we just dedicate the evening to you. We know not the end of it. So as we begin, we pray that you would guide every speaker. I pray that you would allow our hearts to be moved. I pray that your will would become known and plain. Show us what you would have us to do. And I just pray for our country. I pray for our leaders. I ask you, Lord, to draw them to you give them your heart and mind. May this country turn from the course that it is on and may it repent and turn back to you. And we just ask, Lord, that in meetings like this, that your spirit would come down and that you would energize us and empower us. And we just pray a hedge of protection around this place and we plead the blood of Jesus. And we just ask, Lord, now that everything that's done in this place would honor and glorify you for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and let's face the flag and let's say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. If tomorrow all the things were gone I'd work for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars to be living here today Where the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee across the plains of Texas oh from sea to shining sea from Detroit down to Houston and New York to LA where there's pride in every American heart and it's time we stand and say
people said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. would like to um, welcome Matt Dame here tonight. Thank God for him. He is the Jackson County GOP chairman, and uh, they have a meeting tonight. Their executive meeting starts at 7 o'clock, so they don't have a lot of time to be here with us. But Matt does a lot of work in our county for good and for God. He's a friend uh, that I'm getting to know better. And I thank God that he has allowed our paths to cross. I'm thankful to be, a, be able to go to the executive meetings. Appreciate that. And we should pray for Matt. And we should pray for the other folks that are involved in our local GOP. And uh, Bill Richardson's here. He's also from the GOP. Am I missing one? Is there anyone else from the executive meeting that's going to have to slip out? And Julie is going to slip out. I believe the senator is going to slip out. And, uh, but Matt, we're so glad to have you. Thank God for you. So I'm going to have Ron come and introduce our first guest to uh, just say hi to the crowd. We've been on a journey for this last 15 months, haven't we? But you know, through this journey, we've gotten to meet a lot of incredible people. We've finally gotten to look at our country in a different way. We've gotten to appreciate our forefathers, appreciate our Constitution, appreciate its founding and what it was based on, which is Christian principles. It's what separates us from so much of the rest of the world. It would allow us to stand up today, and we could have stood up all this last year if there were enough of us and said, we're not going to put up, we're not going to consent, we're not going to conform to illegal mandates that are against our constitutional rights, but many people did. We all answered a calling at different times in our life. We make choices. And as I started working in Stand Up Michigan on day one when it was just a Facebook group, it was basically to ask the question of, are there other people like us who think there's something wrong with this story, with what it is, where this is headed? We tried to say there's much more to this than what you're hearing now. It's going to get worse. If you think this is a short-term situation, it's not. And we saw what happened to our economy. We saw what happened to us as individuals, to so many businesses, to so many individual lives in nursing homes people that were isolated in their own homes. The mental health crisis is real. And then they went after our children and the schools and the masks. Now it's vaccines. It just goes on and on and on. During this process, I got an opportunity. Never knew the man I'm introducing you until about a year ago now, when I had an initial conversation with him and a couple of his staff people. And uh, from there, we built a, uh, a, a great friendship. And when I say a friendship, I mean somebody who could trust and I could call and ask questions of what is real and what isn't, what's happening and what isn't, what's being said. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and at the same time, we could be honest with each other, honest with each other of what the people feel, what, is, what, what, is, what, what the grassroots are, is happening, how it's affecting those that are in not just a general district, but when you are the leader of the Senate, you are responsible for all. You're responsible for your caucus, uh, leading your caucus and helping them understand where the people are, what it is we're going through to stand up for us. And as you know, in some situations, it's not up to what just an individual or what a party feels or even what a legislature does when you have a governor who is operating outside of the rule of law. That happened last summer. And after June 30th, we made the comment, every executive order that she has right now is an illegal mandate, and you should not and do not need to follow it. And if enough of us didn't follow it, it would have never happened. Amen. But we all did it originally, feeling we were doing the right thing for our family, for our businesses, and whatever personal reasons you had. I believe we're in a different place today. I pray we are. But I can tell you that through this process, um, I have gotten to know Mr. Mike Shirky uh, as, a, as a personal individual 
I've worked with him and kept him up to date on what it is that we the people are accomplishing and doing. And believe me, when we had the Unlock Michigan campaign start and I said, I think we can get 10,000 citizen circulators, it was told that that just can't happen. That, that, does, that, that doesn't happen. Political strategists from around the country said the same thing. People who were donating to the campaign said, boy, I've seen this before, and during a pandemic, there's no, there's no gatherings. How are you gonna get these signatures? Uh, this, this, there's a lot at risk here. And I said, you do not understand the people. They are, they are ready to get to work. And we saw something miraculous happen. We, we saw 40,000 individuals asked to circulate. And they were sent petitions to their homes, and then they said, well, that's fine, but they're not gonna fill them out properly. They're not gonna return them, and if they are, they're not gonna be done right. And, and, it's gonna, and I said, you don't understand. We're, we're gonna continue to talk to them. We're gonna tell them over and over and over again how to do it, and do you know the success rate and the accuracy rate was over 92%. But if this is about you, you're clapping for yourselves. How many circulated? How many actually got, it's incredible. In every room I'm in, I kind of see that. But again, there are 40,000 of you. It could, be, it could be Ford Field full of people. Think about that. That's what we're talking about. The left has not seen what's coming. They do not understand what we're organizing right now because the right doesn't organize like this. We don't get face to face and this and social media, and I'll talk about it later, but big tech is forcing us to come back face to face. It's where we belong. We need to take care of each other. We need to take care of our own families and our own communities. We are the solution, not the government. Right. Not the state government and certainly not Washington, DC. Yeah, I know, they gotta get out of here by 6.30. So I'm gonna bring up, first of all, Mr. Mike Shirky, because it was a big day today in the Senate. I want him to tell you what happened today if you haven't heard. Thank you, Ron. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here, but I'm not naive. I'm not naive. I also see some faces that have some disappointment in them. I'm sorry if you were disappointed, but tonight we're going to celebrate the fact that the Senate today did the first step of a two-step process to ensure that the law of 1945 will be removed from our statute books, never to be given the sun, the, the light of day again. The Senate, thank you, yes, the Senate today, and if the House had been in session, we'd have done both of them. But the House is not gonna be in session until next Wednesday, and I am 100% confident that the same action will occur next uh, Wednesday, and then it will be done for real. Why did we have to do it, take it this far? Because the state Supreme Court deemed it unconstitutional. Well, I'll tell you the reason why, and you know the reason why. is because a future Supreme Court, matter of fact, this current sitting Supreme Court could very easily reverse the decision of the previous one. But when we move them the book, from the books, that can't happen again. But I call it Unlock, originally it was called Unlock Michigan. I call it Unlock One, because that's half the story. Because that's when the governor pivoted, our governor pivoted, and started executing and exploiting and, and using, deploying the public health code to continue to hold us hostage and act unilaterally through the director of the Department of Health and Human Services for another 12 months. And so I hear rumors, I have to be careful about this because it's a citizen-driven initiative, not a legislative-driven initiative, but I hear rumors that language has always been submitted, language has always been, already been approved, language in the form has already been approved by the Secretary of State and the Board of Canvassers and the Board of Elections, and soon citizens like you, I hope, will take up the charge and set yet another record. The first one, the first action that Ron referred to was a record for Michigan, never before. Were there that many signatures collected in that much time, that little time, and with that kind of accuracy? Ron was not exaggerating. It was a one time never before done. And we need to repeat that process again. So be on the alert, be on the alert, because I hear, rumor has it, that Unlock 2 
is in place and in starting to uh, gain some traction. We'll need everybody, we'll need everybody's attention and everybody's effort to do that once again. There'll be hacklers, there'll be those who claim that we don't know what we're talking about, but we do know what we're talking about. And after 28 days, if any governor cannot get and muster the support of their legislature, then there, sh there must be a debate, not a disen disenfranchisement of the, the representatives of the people of Michigan who elected them. So I'm here to thank you, first of all, for actually a number of things I'm thanking you for. Ron, thank you for starting Stand Up Michigan. Just give him a hand. I saw this little fireball and I say that with all due respect uh, in his first meeting and I thought, oh boy, we got a, we got a tiger by the tail, not as long as we got it uh, aimed in the direction that's favorable to us, we are, we're in good hands. But his heart and his passion, his honesty and his commitment is real. Finished up Unlock One. We got Unlock Two that I think is gonna be presented to us soon and we'll be asking for everybody to engage on that. Then we'll have any future governor, not just this governor, but any future governor that will be required to take the legislature by hand and drag them along and win them over or not. And that's the real reason why we need to do it. I understand this is the organizational meeting for the chapter of Stand Up Michigan for Jackson County. These guys have been uh, doing this across the state. I don't know how many of you got so far, Ron? Almost 20. Almost 20. Well, I'm glad that Jackson County is one of the top in the first group of 20. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> but you're signing up for something that requires you not to just put it on your resume saying you're a part of it, but you're signing up for something that requires you to be action in it, involved in it. And we can't accomplish what Ron referred to a moment ago. This is just the beginning of the fights we're going to have. This is going to be well beyond this election. It's going to be well beyond the next 12 months. And so organizing across the state so that we can actually muster people to accomplish things in quick time is precisely what we need. So God bless you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for gathering here tonight. Thank you for helping with Get Unlock One done and prepare yourself for the rest of the summer and into the fall to work on yet another one. Thank you very much. Amen, thank you, Senator. Appreciate that. I'd like to introduce someone who is one of my heroes in life, and that's Julie Alexander. She is one of the finest state reps anywhere in the country, if not the finest. That's my opinion, and I appreciate her. She, let's give her a big hand. She answers calls and texts and is responsive and is a patriot, loves this country, loves this state. We're privileged to have her. Unfortunately, her time in the House is now reaching its conclusion. But I believe God has a plan, and this is not the end of what Julie's going to do for this great state. And we appreciate her. And uh, she's got a scoop, uh, she's got another meeting. She's come to our home, she has been responsive. She went out of her way to come here early. Man, I just appreciate this lady with all my heart. Thank God for Julie Alexander, would you come? I am humbled, I am truly humbled, and I will continue serving as long as I feel that chill when I walk into the Capitol and I'm in awe of that Capitol. And I'm in awe and can't keep from singing when I hear Lee Greenwood sing, God bless the USA. That's what life's about. I don't know where this journey is going to take me. I don't know where it's going to take any of us, do we? But we know we're put here for a reason. My job is to do what I've always done, is to listen to you. I'm a mom. In fact, I had five children in 10 years, because that's what happens when you marry a dairy farmer. <laughs> I'm a nana. 
I'm a military mom. I had a son who served for five years in the Marine Corps. Somewhere along the line, as I was working my profession of a middle school teacher, I met a farmer. And when I said I do at the altar, I've now been a farmer for 34 years. I say all that because we truly are we the people. I want to thank you for what you do. I know you're not happy with us. Like Senator Shirky said, we're not naive. We hear your frustration. But we have parameters as legislators. We have a process we have to follow. I don't like it either. And if any of you have met my husband, you know he doesn't either. <laughs> but what I am here to tell you is, again, thank you for what you do. One of the processes we as legislators have, there is a department, an entity in Lansing, referred to the Office of the Auditor General. And the Auditor General is in place, nonpartisan, to investigate, to look into a variety of matters state-related. I submitted a letter to the Auditor of General last March. Just moments ago, I received the objectives. Let me back up. I submitted a letter last March to the Auditor, of General, Auditor General, and within 24 hours received a response that they would be providing us with an audit of the general election. Just moments ago, I received the objectives of that audit. You are welcome to follow along. It's all public information. It will be listed publicly tomorrow what the objectives are and what the timeline for that audit is. But I think you'll be pleased to know the four objectives of the audit will be to assess, to assess the sufficiency of the efforts to maintain the integrity of the qualified voter file, to assess the effectiveness of selected application and access controls over the QVF system and the electronic poll book. Their third objective will be to assess the sufficiency of selected Board of Elections post-election review procedures to help ensure that the integrity of the elections, and fourth and finally, to assess the sufficiency of the Board of Elections efforts to establish and provide training to the county, city, and township officials who are responsible for conducting elections. I'd like to just wrap up by saying, your voices are heard. We get your frustrations, we hear you. I watch and listen to many videos every day. In fact, I'm grateful for my team that I have that actually watch them for me, document them, and send me to certain marks where they know um, there are areas that we have control over. So I thank you for what you do. And um, again, it's an honor to serve, and I'm ready for part two. Well, amen. Thank you so much. And folks, when you have, when you have to go, feel free to uh, slip out and journey mercies, and Lord bless you. Thank you for coming and making tonight special. It is very special to all of us here. I would like to next introduce any pastors that are here. Do we have any other uh, men of God, servants of the Lord? Uh, Brother Terry yeah. Tomlinson. Right. And he is from the Coldwater area. Right. And let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Amen. Good to see you. And he and I are going to be working together in the future. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'd also like to ask if there's any grassroots type uh, groups, uh, leaders, or anyone involved in other grassroots uh, movements, uh, not uh, Jackson County Stand Up or the Jackson GOP. How about some grassroots movements? I know that we have at least one. She's going to come and greet our group in just a moment. Anyone else from um, a grassroots uh, movement? getting involved in election integrity, getting involved in things of that nature. Well, we do have Patrice Johnson. She is from Pime, and that is Pure Integrity in Michigan Elections, and they're in the Stockbridge area, and her husband is here, and we thank God for them, and they have meetings twice a month, and <clears throat> they are very active, and met her out at Tim's home 
uh, when we were gathering for our grassroots election integrity type uh, meetings. But I, I thank the Lord for the wonderful organization that you have, and it is growing, and thank God for you. So why don't you come and greet your friends? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first off, off, I'd like to have people who are members or supporters of uh, Pure Integrity for Michigan Elections, please stand up. Take a bow. <laughs> we got a crowd. We got a good crowd here. Good showing. <laughs> we started um, um, after the election, and um, in January, I think it was, we were sitting, six of us were sitting around our, Jim's in my home, my husband Jim is here with us, and we were saying, what are we going to do? We're losing our country. That's right. And um, we decided we better prioritize. Kathy McClinchy said, well, we better focus on election integrity because without that, we don't have anything. That's right. That's right. Um, and since then, we've been, uh, we set up a web page and logo and we've been meeting. Um, we go to pretty much all of the hearings that deal with election integrity and testify in terms of our statement. So we have a policy statement that we work through and modify as, as uh, we learn more. Um, personally, I have never been involved in politics. Um, I'm a mother. Um, I've had stage four cancer and survived, I'm pleased to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> they recently kicked me out of the cancer center, said it had been seven years and I no longer could come back. So <laughs> mixed, mixed feelings about that. But um, our, our view is that our legislators need our support. Um, our legislators on the conservative side are just people like us. They're people that were drawn into service and, and speaking for myself, I haven't been paying attention. These people have been paying attention and they're paying a price now because things aren't going the way they should and they need support. Um, it doesn't mean we agree with everything that hasn't been passed. We think a lot of, of uh, election integrity efforts need to be made. We need to close up. We need to think of elections unlike ways we've thought about them in the past. In the past, we've thought of what, how should we make it um, efficient and fair and, and safe for all of our electorate, for every, people to come in to vote. But now what we need to do is we need to say, okay, how can this, how can, what is the exposure to cheating? Okay, here's a gap. How do we close that? Oh, here's another gap. How do we close that? And that's a lot of work. That takes thinking um, that we don't necessarily have because we're not that type of person that goes around cheating. It, but if you take the recent oversight report, one, one, just one example, um, it says in there that the tabulator machines were not connected to the internet. They were connected to a local area network. Well, my background is in technology. I've founded four technology companies. And I can tell you that wherever it says interface or ever, whatever it says local area network, it means that those systems are communicating. And if one system has one modem on that network, there is an exposure to hacking. And where there can be hacking, there will be hacking. And we need to think that way. We need to think defensively. So I don't want to carry on up here. <laughs> I'm getting carried away, but thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to learn about Stand Up Michigan, and we're very pleased to be active and involved in politics. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. And uh, just on that subject, I haven't slept that well since November 3rd, and I've never been this active in politics before November 3rd. And for me personally, the most important issue in my life, uh, other than the Lord Jesus Christ and my family, the work of God, but as far as public life, election integrity, is the most important thing. My prayer and my hope, and uh, 
a vision that I have is that we can have a full forensic audit in our state of Michigan that we could look at every ballot and I so appreciate what you said and I appreciate the work that you have done you've been a leader thank God for it but my prayer and and I may be the only one here tonight who believes that way but I want a I'm praying so we could touch every ballot look at them in a controlled way and find out if Joe Biden won Michigan because I have a hard time believing it that's that's just my heart I I, I don't sleep well and I see they're locking down our capital socialism's on the march the things that have changed since november is horrendous and anyway that's my my blurb on election integrity thank god for pime keep on doing what you're doing and i do understand there's a process and you can only do what you could do but i believe god i believe god i believe god is able um, to show us what happened uh, to to the satisfaction of probably more than half the country. So that's our heartbeat. And uh, we pray that God will do something for us and for the country. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. So I want to introduce you to some very special people. These are people that are standing up. Um, in, in a moment, I, I do see we have Jonathan here, Jonathan Lindsay, a Senate candidate. And uh, I'm going to have him come up in just a moment. I want to hear from you. I want you to be able to greet the folks. Thank God for you. But I want to introduce Jennifer Bedinger. She is the vice president of uh, Stand Up Michigan, Jackson County. She's been working behind the scene, a very uh, dedicated person. Would you just come and say hi to the folks? Okay, hi. Any pages in here? Use your voices, yay! I'm so excited to be here, if you haven't noticed. I love to be around people because we've been so censured, we've been, um, it's so encouraging to encourage each other, and I'm glad you're here, to, uh, you're here to be encouraged too, and that we can all encourage each other. This is all new to me. Um, I was very content in my little cocoon of life. Um, family, friends, church, um, I did not want to get involved with the troubles of the world outside of my little cocoon. I was very blessed. But then, bam. Um, Two major catastrophes, the God closed the door on what I thought my life was going to be. And secondly, the enemy changed everyone's world with the virus. It is a virus, all right. Um, their plot was not only to kill people with it, but to poison our economy, our government, our judicial systems, and through the corrupted media, spread fear and false information. So I know that really didn't happen overnight, but uh, they have been corrupting our children's minds and bodies for years. But now it's all fully out in the open, right? Um, my husband and I were disgusted and angry. Um, we had stopped listening to the outright lies and false information in the network news and been regularly watching the videos and broadcasts at home, which informed us of the real truths. Um, so we knew there were many patriots out there somewhere, but all we could see were people who were just following along or dissenting the truth. Um, so what could we do? I went to church, I came home. I went to the store, I came home. I had my little errands, but uh, it seemed like the only thing I could do was refuse to patronize the shops that made me wear a mask or be the only one in a store that didn't have a mask on, you know. But um, I still didn't think that was making any difference. I did not realize the importance of having my voice heard and represented. So we continue to pray that God would destroy the evil and corruption and that he would guide us and use us, my wonderful husband and I, uh, for whatever purposes he had for us. So in April, we received an email from Amy Hawkins, and unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. But man, what an amazing patriot. If you're not on her email list, get on it right now. She is a person of information, as they used to say in those old movies that I love to watch. Um, I think she got her name from Unlock Michigan, and um, which was key to breaking my stubborn stance on never signing a petition and never getting involved. Um, but I knew because of the tyranny that it was now time to act. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Amy, Amy's email stated that a few people were gathering to see what they could do for Patriot effort, efforts and how we could help our community, county, and state. So. 
we were hoping this might be an answer to our prayer. So we went right here in this church the first time. And um, boy, she got me going. That's an understatement. Um, she and her team, which is a wonderful team, the whole leaves are here tonight. Um, Tim's here, uh, several of you here were so inspiring and I thank you so much. Um, they got me going. I was so green in politics, but eager to learn and anxious to speak up. And I wanted to get involved in everything. Um, my husband worked so hard, he couldn't participate. And so I ended up running by myself, going to this meeting, going here, speaking out here um, at the council meetings. That was fun. Um, but, and then, but we were able to also go up to Antrim County. We had no idea how far that was, but we went up there. That was great to be with the Patriots up there. Um, we've been to Lansing. Um, anyway, I know he said a couple minutes, but this is, this is great. So, okay. So uh, we, then we heard about a meeting with Ron Armstrong and Julie Alexander were gonna be at his house. And we were like, oh, that's great. Cause you know, Stand Up Michigan, we had been with following them for quite some time. They were key to, uh, we knew they had found a way to stand up in Michigan and we wanted to be a part of it. So we went and at the um, end of the meeting, they wanted to know if there was anyone who would be willing to step up and work at establishing the new Jackson County Stand Up Michigan. Right. I was somewhat shocked sitting there. My husband was behind me. I was looking here towards, and all of a sudden I hear my husband say, Jennifer and I would be willing to jump in and do <laughs> I just was like, okay, Lord, we had prayed and this must be it. So I was all in from then on. And um, it has, I have fumbled along. I have to tell you uh, just a quick funny thing. I, um, I make mistakes and that should encourage you to all join in because we all make mistakes. Vanessa, oh my goodness, she helped me. I'm not a techie. She's helped me do a lot of That's stuff right. with that. Um, the recent thing, I, I, when I was putting out the information for this, I must've been thinking about Patch Pirate because I put Ron Hamilton in the, in the bulletin. <laughs> And good, thankfully, Pastor saw it. I'm like, oh, how hilarious. But anyway, um, so get in, do what you can. It doesn't matter. God will help you do what you need to do. And, and Melissa is, and, and Brian, we've all just stumbled along. It's just been wonderful. So anyway, um, we ultimately believe God wins our battles for us. But he uses we the people also to fight. Amen. Yes, fight, not physically but with weapons of truth and righteousness. And it is a spiritual battle. The rich and powerful want to be your gods. And the goal of the enemy is to turn us away from truth. God is the great physician, not the CDC and Mishta or whatever that is. He's our great judge and ruler of all, not the corrupt government and courts. His word teaches us his children truth, not the humanistic education that hates God. Um, if you can't see the evil and corruption flooding in, take off the blinders. If you can't see how they're poisoning our future generations and how the media is lying and distorting truth, take off the blinders. It's so obvious even non-believers can see the wicked corruption. Um, good people are more afraid of what man might do to them than fearing God. And we have to help them to take courage and fight against it. So um, do you know the antonym for fight, surrender, and yield? Did Daniel yield? Did Jesus Christ yield? Did Martin Luther King yield? Or did our patriot forefathers yield to the evil tyrant? No! We will not yield to the enemy. With the Lord's help, let's keep going, let's keep growing, let's keep praying, and let's make our voices heard. That lady's got some preach in her. <laughs> Amen. Very well said. Thank God for the heavy lifting you've been doing since we had that meeting at our home. It's the Lord. Amen. Brian, what a dear friend. Thank God. Do you want to come and say a word, my dear brother? He is our, he's our treasurer, and uh, he stepped up to do that. And Don Bittinger is our assistant treasurer. And uh, so Brian's a part of Pime. He's also a part of Maple Grove Baptist Church. He's a fellow brother in the Lord, and he's a warrior. And thank God for him. Why don't you come, brother? Hey, Mike! 
Okay. Well, my name's Brian Such, and everything the pastor said is true. Um, I really, I spent a lot of time trying to decide what I was going to talk about today. And up until yesterday, I had a nice white bread talk I was going to give about patriotism and all that. And darn it, I think just like the pastor, four o'clock in the morning, I was awoken or awakened. And a voice said, this is what you're going to say tomorrow. So I was up taking notes as quick as I can before I forgot them. So some people might be upset with this, but, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know? Okay. So I'm 70 years old. I'm retired. I spent my whole life in steel mills. So it was kind of a rugged, rough environment. I'm a um, former Fleet Marine corpsman. I spent 13 months in Vietnam uh, taking care of the wounded uh, in the field. I have very little tolerance for lies. You know, I just, I don't know. So I'm a cranky old guy, okay? So just, just keep that in mind. And I have a confession to make, okay? I'm the reason why the country is in the shape it's in today. Why do I say that? Well, I first voted in 1972 for Richard Nixon. I liked Richard Nixon. Why did I like him? Because he got the troops out of Vietnam. Okay. However, I did find out that Richard Nixon was dealing under the table with the South Korean president. Don't negotiate peace. Wait till I get elected and I'll make you a better deal. These are actually tapes that Lyndon Johnson recorded. So here we have a politician willing to sell out American lives so he can get office in the White House. I have nothing good to say about Nixon anymore about that. Okay, too many of my friends died. So after that, I voted for uh, President Ford, Ronald Reagan, Bush one and two, and President Trump. I didn't know much or care much about the other politicians. I figured they're Republicans, they're good people, they're gonna do what I expect. And happily and blindly, I just went along voting red my whole life. Okay. President Trump, Trump came in office. What can you say bad about that guy, right? The market was up, employment was up, peace in the Middle East, troop withdrawals, energy independence, recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, Amen. support for Israel, a border wall, American first policy, right to life, and unashamed, never having to explain or apologize for what he did because he knew what he was doing was right. He was not going to sell out America for his own gain. He stood up for the common people. Unfortunately, Trump's problem was he was not an insider. Washington politics, or politics in general, is a good old boys club. You're either in the club or you're not. Trump did nothing to deserve impeachment, but they booted him out, right? Because why? Because he didn't play the game, okay? Thank God Donald Trump came along when he did. If he, if he hadn't, Clinton would have been president. Where would, be, where would be, be, we be today? Okay. What's that? We'd be speaking Chinese. Yeah, we'd be speaking Chinese or Russian or something like that. So, what, what really bothers me now is who's speaking for me right now? In the federal government, there's a couple guys, Cruz. I like the way he talks. I like the way he talks. And remember that movie, Sling Blade? Okay, anyhow. <laughs> this is not a movie-going crowd. 
okay? Um, Kennedy from Louisiana. I just love that guy. Talk about an old homespun guy, but he calls it like he sees it, okay? Uh, McCarthy, I like McCarthy. And who's the other fellow I like? Oh, Jim Jordan from Ohio, okay? Jim never stops fighting. Every time he's on TV, he's, he's out doing something, okay? There's like 260 some other people uh, in, in Congress. Oh, hell, more than that. Um, all I hear is crickets. I don't hear anything from the other Republicans, okay? So, after the November elections, we got together, like Patrice uh, said, and decided we have to do something. We just can't sit around here and complain, okay? Better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So, Patrice got that candle lit and keeps it going. Thank you, Patrice, okay? But why, why didn't anybody speak up after the election? Anybody got any reasons? Why, why do you think that is? And I don't know, I don't have a reason, but why didn't they fight for us? Why didn't they fight for fair elections? I know some people that tried. They were shut down, they got no support, they were left to hang out and dry, okay? Maybe they knew something that we don't. Was the election fair? Well, if it was fair, then show us it was fair. Why didn't the other side consent to a, a recount? Because they know it wasn't fair. Okay. One, one political party cannot take over this country. Okay. There has to be help, and there's help on both sides. And as far as I'm concerned right now, from what I'm seeing, I don't see a whole lot of difference between Republicans and Democrats. So, so that's my problem. My problem was I trusted Republicans. I trusted that they would speak for me. The pastor here has taught me, where do you put your trust? One place. You put your trust in God. God will never fail you. He'll never let you down. So I guess the message I want to uh, give today is elections are coming up. The elections are gonna be worthless if we don't have changes in election laws before the election. Michigan has to have a forensic audit. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna plagiarize something that I heard a very intelligent lady named Linda Tarver uh, talk about. Here's a couple pages from the Michigan Constitution. Okay. Article one, section one. All political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal benefit, security, and protection. Number one, we are the power, not the politicians. Okay, <clears throat> if the people don't run the government, the government will run the people. Okay, we're not gonna let that happen. Okay, the other thing, I don't understand the hang up on this. <clears throat> Michigan Constitution, section two, or article two, section four, paragraph H. The right to have the results of statewide elections audited. This is the rights that the Constitution gives us. We have the right to an audit. Why does it take so long? Why? It's our right. Uh, we'll give you your rights, you know, six months down the road. Next, next election, you'll get your rights next. I want my rights now, okay? We need to exercise our rights now, because if we don't, we're not going to have them. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, what I, what I wanna leave you with is, I don't know who's gonna be nominated for the party, but we were told by a very wise man, Professor William Wagner, 
that we cannot change at our, we cannot change the U.S. government. Okay? We can change our local governments and our townships, and that's where it has to start. Okay? We need to get involved. We can't trust what somebody tells us. We can't trust the politician to say, I am so good, look what I did for you. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a minute. Okay? So, let's get involved. Let's work at the township level. Let's, uh, let's learn a little something. Professor Wagner put on a wonderful series here on the Constitution. Uh, it was eye-opening eye-opening how far away we are from the Constitution right now and how the government gets away with it. I don't understand that. The Constitution is the law of the land and it needs to be followed by everyone. Okay, Where does the authority from the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence come from? From where? The, but it from God. Okay, the De Declaration of Independence said King George is not, is not God. We don't follow the king's law, we're going to follow God's law. And that's what we need to do. We need to come back to God. We need to come back to doing what's right. Okay, so please, everybody, get involved. Um, don't, I, there's a couple good websites. I was checking up on some people today. And a couple good websites you might want to look at is uh, michiganvotes.org. It'll tell you how all the different senators and representatives have voted on different issues. You can check up on them. And then there's mcfn.org, the Michigan Campaign Finance Network. You can see where the money's coming from on some of these people. Two documents I have here. Am I taking too long? Okay, I'm going to move. Two documents I got here. 2020 Democratic Platform. 2020 Republican Platform. When you see politicians and they're not doing right, ask them, how come you're not following the Republican platform? You claim to be a Republican. Follow the platform. Otherwise, you're not a Republican. Okay? You're a rhino. And we got plenty of rhinos in Congress and, and all over politics right now. And they need to go. And the only way we can get rid of them is we have to have their performance evaluation called free and fair elections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Brian. All righty. I'd like to introduce you to Melissa. And what a blessing she is. This is Melissa Her. She is our secretary. Got to know her a couple months ago. She came to our home, came to the meeting. And when we asked who will get involved, because um, I didn't have a lot of bandwidth. And Tim didn't have a lot of bandwidth, but we wanted to see something happen. And these people, these three folks, these in this family stood up and said, we want to do something. Melissa has a very wonderful uh, message and she's going to share it with us. So, I am very, very, very new to this. So new, these are my notes, right? So they've taught me so much and everybody's been a ton of help. Thanks to Jen, especially holding my hand through all of this. I am an original Trump supporter. I love Trump, yeah. period. I don't care who likes it and who don't like it, okay? I grew up in the bar business. I've been in the bars my whole life. I am probably 
not as conservative as the majority of you, but I am 100% American, and you are all my people, and we all have to work together. So I have nothing bad to say about anybody. All I have to say is get ready for the great American comeback, because as long as people are willing to fight for us, as long as warriors are willing to stand up for us, as long as people are willing to just stay by each other, we can stop them. We, we maybe didn't know how to, so we have to learn. We have to learn things like Robert's Rules of Order. Right? <laughs> or you have to learn not to interrupt when people are talking all the time. And maybe pay more attention to what is going on. Because clearly, we weren't paying attention. When we went to sleep on election night, me and all my friends from all the bars, we got together, we ate, we drank, we were married, we smoked, we had a great time, right? We all went to bed, we were like, Trump's president again. We woke up and somehow Biden beat us. I don't understand how it happened and I don't know how anybody can live with themselves knowing that. So I'm only here to put a smile on everybody's face, to do what I can do, and to say that you can't change people with negative attitudes. So we have fussed and complained about everything till we were blue in the face. I don't know how it happened. I knew they were gonna cheat and they got away with it. I don't know. So all I have to say is I'm gonna work and when the pat, you know, like everybody said, how'd you end up at some? I'm like, cause I told the pastor I would. I can't unsay it now, here I am, you know? <laughs> this is how it works, I don't know. All I know is that what I learned from everybody, I'm gonna take back to the bars and the restaurants and the inner cities and the trailer parks and the places that I come from, which is usually outside everybody else, and tell them because they're not, they just don't know. We just don't know. You know, we, so when you figure it out, and we'll figure it out together somehow, right? When we figure it out, we'll let everybody know and all of America will go back to being the way it used to be when we cared about each other. This is ridiculous, hating America like we do. So. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea. So I have nothing to say other than I am really glad that I'm here and I am your official Beck and Paul girl. Okay? <laughs> thank you. And thank you for letting Jonathan come here. And I would like to introduce my friend. I, I am so new to this, it's only been a, two months. That's how long I've been to going to these things. And Marcy has helped me so much. Judge McBain introduced me to Marcy and was like, this is the woman that's going to help you get involved locally. So the first time she takes me to a meeting with Professor Wagner, right? And I met Jonathan and his lovely wife, Allison, who's not here. But I adore them. And we've got to be pretty good friends over the last couple months. So he's out here today because I asked him to come and I want him to speak. And I, I love Jonathan. He's a warrior already. So if you can't trust our, our military and our vets and our police officers, who can you trust, right? So I fully stand behind anybody who's willing to take care of us. I love you. I love the things you did. Even if it only cost me $20,000, I am happy, okay? <laughs> and he'll tell you that. Thank you, everybody, for coming out here. This is Jonathan Lindsay. He is a candidate for the Michigan Senate, and he's going to come and greet our people. Thank you, Pastor Lang. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Miss, for the kind introduction. I actually wasn't expecting to be speaking tonight, so I have got a really abbreviated version of who I am, what I believe. Um, Christ is my Savior. The United States is the greatest country the earth has ever known. And Joe Biden didn't get 81 million votes. Um, this really is inspiring. The people of Michigan are inspiring. I mean, they really are. I moved back here uh, a few years ago from Tennessee, and a lot of people said to me, you're, you're going the wrong way. People go to Tennessee from Michigan now, which is sad to hear, but I'm so happy that I came back. And the people that I remember from my youth, I grew up down in, on a farm in Branch County. The people, the spirit I remember, it's still here. Um, and I like to think maybe it's because if you live in Michigan, I mean, you've got to have some gumption because uh, <laughs> the system doesn't give you any advantages here. One joke I've told before is that uh, when an economic crisis comes around in Michigan, and people say, well, how are you doing? How are you dealing with it? I say, well, the fortunate thing is we don't notice because we haven't gotten over the last one yet. So, um, <laughs> But... Uh, 
the people are inspiring. And, he, and even all the terrible things that have happened over the last 15 months, the challenges we've faced, the people have come together. And that's what's inspiring about Unlock, about Stand Up, right? People coming together. And I think we need to see that same level of spirit from the leaders that are in our government. I'm going to also say some things tonight that are, um, you know, may be controversial, but I think we do need stronger leadership. I think we need warriors in the, in the Michigan GOP, in the House, in the Senate. So I said uh, I grew up down in Branch County. Uh, I left there first to go to college. I went and got a degree in political science at Yale University. And after that, I uh, decided to join the military. So I went into the United States Army, and I spent seven years in the Army Special Forces, uh, three combat deployments, a bunch of medals that I, my wife tells me I have to say I got these awards. But, um, and I learned a lot, but some of the things when I come back here and I see the way that uh, our leaders, if we want to call them that in the GOP in Michigan, are handling things, it's frankly disappointing. Um, we have people talking a lot and, and paying lip service to election integrity, but here's something that I say, you know, um, the election in 2020 in Michigan was not stolen. If anybody thinks that they're wrong, the election was given away. Yeah. And it was given away by Republican leaders, yeah. right? Yeah. Our founders foresaw this. They didn't just give us a great constitution, the greatest nation ever. They gave us a lot of things that we could use if we would actually believe what we say. I'm a constitutionalist. I believe, go back to the constitution. They looked at um, the way we're going to elect president, and they were extremely concerned that someone was going to get involved and try to subvert the process. And so they wrote uh, a, a way to handle this through electors that would prevent that. And if you look in Federalist 68, they go through their thinking about this and say, this is one of our safeguards. We give absolute power to the state legislators to determine how we're going to handle this process. In December, let me, let me read you one thing that I said in November shortly after this uh, election took place. I'm sorry, I'll try to be quick and wrap through this stuff. But, uh, so I've posted this on Facebook. I said, I recently updated my profile picture to one of me in uniform. If you know me well, you know it's irregular for me to post anything about my service, let alone a profile picture. I've never promoted it before, but I'm calling that chip in now, and I want to be seen in uniform when engaging with, on here, especially with the pages of elected officials. We send our citizens into war zones to do all sorts of things. People who wear the uniform <clears throat> have played an active role in helping secure any number of foreign elections at great personal risk. If a city in Iraq run by one faction refused to follow election laws, delayed results, then reported record turnout, nearly all for one candidate, we would all instinctively say, that's not okay. If the media and government officials of Iraq came out and broadcast messages to the population saying, there is no evidence of fraud, everything is okay, accept the results or you will be punished, we would all know better. And if all the while we, we would be furious if our men and women put their lives on the line for such a travesty. This is happening in the United States of America. It doesn't matter who wins the election or at least that's not the point. We should have an election system that is 100% transparent. We should not have b ballots counted in the night while keeping any meaningful observation away. We should not accept a system totally open to ballot stuffing that would make a banana republic blush. Our elected officials and media should not work together to shut down and dismiss questions about irregularities. I've yet to ever ask for anyone for anything based on my service. I am now. For anyone who has ever thanked me for my service, I, I'm humbled every time I hear you say it. But please pick up your phone and call your representatives. Demand answers. Refuse to accept that the glaring problems in our election systems go unresolved. Fast forward. <laughs> Fast forward to December, and there was one clear answer at that point. We already knew that the election was conducted illegally. We knew there were massive amounts of irregularities. And we knew there was one body in every state that was responsible for stepping in and safeguarding the election, that was the legislature. In Michigan, it's run by Republicans. They should have stood up and sent electors for Donald J. Trump for president. Yeah. 
they should have done it because it was the right thing to do, and they should have done it to send a loud and clear message that anybody that tries to subvert our election will run into a wall. We will not allow it here. But instead, our leaders in the GOP in Michigan came out and actually argued against the Constitution of the United States, and they did what you've heard here already tonight, that I am deeply sympathetic to what you believe. I, there are so many problems, but we have a process and we can't do anything. Well, pick up the Constitution and read the Elector's Clause. There is a process. I'm tired of legislators saying, I don't have the power, my hands are tied. Yeah. When they have the power, they need to use it. They didn't, and that's how we are where we are today. Everything that we hear about, the critical race theory, and I, you know, coming from the military, we watch this. The troops are being purged based on their ideology. We just saw a report come out, I don't know if anyone read this, where the Navy officers have reported that we spend more time on diversity training than we do on war fighting, and it's caused all sorts of problems across the force. There are myriad problems coming from the federal government. They all exist right now because Joe Biden is sitting there because Republican legislators in states like Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, didn't stand up and do the right thing. We need to elect people who promise, and I guess punchline, if you put me there, I will fight for this. I, w I am already pursuing, I will ask everyone who's running for the legislature in Michigan, and I'll reach out to other states and ask them to pledge and make sure they understand the responsibility they have been given by the United States Constitution when it comes to presidential elections. One last thing, all the hubbub about reforming election laws, when it comes to presidential elections, tomorrow our legislature should get, could get together with no input from the governor, no veto, no need to override, and they could pass election law reform specifically for the presidential elections, and it would be a strong sign that they actually believe what they're telling all of you they believe. We could demand photo ID. We could demand no absentee voting, voting unless you're in the military, the old system we used to use. So please, hold your elected officials accountable. If anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I've got cards and everything. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, I, I think there's a burden on the hearts of Americans. I cannot shake it. I can't. And it's a blessing to hear the passion because we're not going to turn the ship around by just sitting around being idle. This is a time that every single person has got to give everything they have. Just like some precious people did about 250 years ago. We wouldn't be here without them. I'm going to introduce a very wonderful lady, uh, but I would be remiss if I did not recognize some very special people who just walked in the house. And so glad Brian introduced your friends and our friends. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Lee Tyler. Amen. Suppose Senate hearings on elections. She was the last person to speak. She knew where the bodies were buried. And she told, like, you know, she told the truth that a lot of people didn't want to hear. And I thank God that she was here because she lit the fire in me. Amen. She said, we got people that know that there was fraud, that could prove there was fraud. But, you know, sometimes just being a voice in the wilderness, but that's going to change. And her wonderful husband, Clint. <laughs> So glad to have you both. Amen. I would like to talk to you about a, a, a wonderful person who survived a situation in India, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her story. But Nemu Carillon is a national, public, and motivational Christian speaker, a public servant in her community, 
an active member of the National Federation of Republican Women since 2007, a member now actively serving on the Diversity Committee of the NFRW on a state level. Nemu is a constitutional activist, a CEO and director of Somerset Child Care LLC, specializing in early year development and learning center, a member of the Hillsdale County Republican Executive Committee, has served with multiple government related entities within Hillsdale and Lenawee County in various fields of political platform within the planning uh, counselor and uh, served as a mayor pro tem. She has recently served as Hillsdale County Commissioner. Along with that, she has served as liaison to eight public safety committees in Hillsdale County, which includes board liaison to the medical examiner's office, participating in all autopsy studies and investigations, 911 Central Dispatch, Community Action Agency, Fire Chiefs Association, Hillsdale County Planning Commission, Sheriff's Office, FEMA Advisory Council, and the Circuit Court Advocating, Transpar advocating Transparency, Honor, and Integrity. They move currently provides interface with the county and local governments and is working closely with the public as a planning commissioner. She currently is serving as a precinct delegate and has continued to communicate the values of the Republican Party to women of all colors and walks of life. She has been a speaker at various conventions and rallies at the Capitol Lansing as well as Washington, D.C. On January 5th of this year, Nemu was in the invited keynote speaker in Washington, D.C. Capitol at the Moms for America Save the Republic rally. Praise the Lord. Nemu is a pro-life voice for the unborn, a devout Christian, believes in the flag, our national anthem, and defends the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. Her political savvy, deeply held conservative and constitutional convictions, well-documented and researched opinions contribute to a strong political activism on local, state, and national constitutional Republican levels. She garnered significant experience in all aspects of her professional life cycle from earning a master's in speech and language pathology, working with children and hearing impaired all over Asia. Helped organize few customer service industries planning and developing small startup companies within improved job creations for over a decade in several counties to working with two leading airlines. And uh, this is uh, quite rich, and it just goes on and on <laughs> and on. What a blessing. And she said that she wanted to help us with our new county chapter when I met her at Pime on the Saturday the 26th of June and she says count me in I want to be there I want to be a help and it sounds like she's got the goods and so we welcome Nemu to greet us wow thank you so honored to be in the house of God and I am truly humbled so I go by Nemu Carl and thank you so much for that really vast introduction. I'm, I'm actually a nobody. I, I'm just uh, a wife. I have three children, and uh, that is the most important thing. But above that is just serving my Lord, my personal Savior, Jesus Christ. So, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, it's a very, it's a story of a girl okay, who was the very first newborn child honored and handcrafted with a golden spoon at birth. And this child, this is a story of a child who was born not only with just gold, this is pure gold, but it's a symbol of an heir, a gold and a silver spoon. A handcrafted golden spoon, and it was granted to this child at birth, okay? A child who lived a life growing as a princess in a coastal area in India called Goa. 
ready to inherit her war veteran parents' estate soon at a suitable age, lived a very prestigious life, attended international boarding school starting at a tender age of only three years of age. Academics, state championship, sports became an idol during the growing up years, gifts, traveling, luxury, BMWs, chauffeur-driven cars, white satin dresses were the common platform and the framework of an extraordinary life. But on the side of enemies of war veteran parents from within the relative sector, all kind of tied up with the property, inheritance, government somehow had ties, played a strange vibe. And all of that came to a sudden halt from innocence to trauma in one day. Lacerated intestines pulled out, beaten to death, thrown away for dead, cliff over 30,000 feet and pronounced dead to the ailing parents forever, changing their life of king, queen, and princess life. End of a fairy tale. You know, it's always nice to hear a beautiful poem, a beautiful love story, but what do you do when you have a picture of a scar, a picture of a scar, a picture of a deep scar? It tells you something about a trauma. I label it as tyranny. I label it as tortured for Christ. Now, this was about 28 years ago when a group of citizens staged a bloody revolt against what was, at that time in India, as one of the most powerful empire. When the dust settled, a new me was born. That story that you just heard was of me. I was that princess who died of tyranny, but was brought back, and I was based on something called liberty. Sadly, at that time, I found myself as a tipping point, arguably near the end of India's long decline. I was certain that my government at that time would continue its march to its tyranny. And despotism, because that's what India's very own nature tends to accumulate, power and enroach up on individual liberty based on that process. You know, terminology comes to my mind. The modern urban legend. It's a sad reality today, but presenting a global picture of child organ trafficking, this emphasizes that child organ trafficking is no longer a myth, let me just tell you that but a reality which has to be addressed. It argues that the international efforts against organ trafficking, trafficking in human beings, is an organ removal, have failed to address this issue, which is child organ trafficking adequately. A Couple of pointers, I'll just throw it out. Define organ trafficking and transplant tourism. Identify contributing factors to illegal organ trade. Recognize countries commonly engage in organ trafficking. India ranks number one. Have a basic understanding efforts aim to stop organ trafficking. Just one answer, an all too real byproduct of tyranny. The current White House occupant, I refuse to call him the president, Joe Biden said on day one, we are in a battle for the soul for this nation. Well, I believe he said it right. We in the United States are in a battle with a party that supports killing unborn babies, selling their body parts, encourages mob action, vilifies and demands to defund the police, and labels many citizens, let me see if I can pronounce that, deplorables. Vital organs to be harvested? What? One problem. Vital organs decompose within minutes of true death. I know it because I was aboard liaison and attended every autopsies with Hillsdale County Sheriff and the medical examiner investigator. So new criteria were needed to declare a person dead when he's still having a beating heart, circulation, respiration, feeding oxygen to his cells is alive. Let me define organ trafficking. The practice of using exploitation, coercion, fraud to steal illegal purchase of or sell organs. What's transplant tourism? It's the act to travel to a foreign country for the purpose of buying, selling, or receiving organs. Just a little statistics here for you. Don't know if you can see it this far. It's a body, corneas, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys. The rate and the price for each is 
for coronary is about $30,000, lungs about $150,000, heart $130,000, liver $98,000, kidney $62,000 and above. Out of all of this, only one thing for me that was not touched was my heart, because that belongs to Jesus. Hiding in plain sight. India apparently is ranked, like I said, as number one organ brokers where human traffickers involved in cutthroat deals that are enforced with violence. So during this trauma, which was induced for 11 months of intensive care, I was in coma, hospitalization. I was made aware of something very special. God was with me. Those of you who have your word of God here with you, your holy Bible, Psalms 139, 7 and 8, and it says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is hell, you are there. That's the worst. God talked to me with that worst. I was neither alive or dead. I was in complete darkness. But what was shown to me during the coma was the tabernacle where I saw three things. It's a big thing for a 10 or 11 year old to see a tabernacle in their sleep, in their deep induced coma. I saw the golden stamp, the golden lampstand that is the menorah. I saw the altar of incense and the last is the table of showbread. It's difficult for a lot of us to just understand the word of God, Exodus especially, but for a young child of 10, 11, in such a deep situation, the Lord started to reveal himself. I was in the tabernacle. Wow. Now the golden stamp, it was lamp, it was all made out of one piece of gold, hammered. Pieces were put together, and all of that was seven different sticks with flames. And I said, Lord, what is this? What is it that that looks like the seven sticks on each of what that's a menorah that that I understand now well what he told me with that it gave me hope he says I will be your hope of the shadow of spirit revelations one if you refer to it talks about Lord says he says you're going to he promised me that he was going to walk with me because the tabernacle is all about walking with the Lord and you're going to be born again not by the will of man but by the will of flesh but by the will of the Spirit of God. That was a huge revelation for a child who's just neither alive or dead. Nobody there, no parents, because they thought I was dead. The second I saw right in the holy place, it was a tabernacle, I'm looking at the altar of incense. I said, Lord, now what is this? Where have you taken me now? He says, you're in the holy place, and you've seen now the lampstand, and I'm going to signify what the lampstand is going to do for you. Then I said, Lord, what is, what is this thing, this, this incense? Because I know in India they do incense all the time with, to their idols. I mean, they're constantly burning it. But Lord, what do I see this in, in this place? It's too holy. I don't understand. He says, well, it's a shadow of a prayer life of a saint. And what he told me, he spoke to me that I'm going to have you ceaselessly have a prayer life. Just like the New Testament says, our prayer life is not just concentrating on the superficial, but it's concentrating on material needs. It consists of words that are spoken out loud and of the depth of a prayer life that needs to be silent, but it needs to be motivation from the heart. And it's constantly, you're going to constantly think about God. Has the Lord revealed me? What, what is this? Because I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it all out. Got me another revelation, Exodus 30. So here I go to Exodus 30, and I'm going to read that to you. 30, Exodus 30, verse 9. It takes, I don't want to, and he, and he gives me that. What I'll explain that to you is, is, is trying to say that I don't want you to just burn any, just for the incense sake or anything, but don't, don't mix it. I'm going to give you the right words to pray. Believe that you're going to be hearing the correct words. And that when I'm going to have you pray, you're going to pray that God is not interested in being pampered in the intelligence of the flesh, but he's more interested in forming the new Jesus in me. I think that's why my heart was never touched. And then I move on to see the third thing, which was the table of the showbread. And what I see was 
the six loaves on this side and the six loaves on the other side. To total, all of them were 12, 12 loaves on each side. And then the Lord speaks to me again. He says, God is always going to be present, he said. He said, that signifies you because you're going to live in this world and you're going to be looking around for situations and you're going to possibly look at situations where God is not, you know, involved. Maybe you're going to see situations like people getting hurt, dying violent crimes, organ harvesting, all types of atrocities and abnormalities. But what was promised to me in that was he said, I'm going to be with you. You're going to need to fight this. You're going to have a long journey ahead of you. What that show bread is actually a show bread. It's a face that God never takes his eyes off. And he never did. He never did. His love was always upon me, protecting me as long as he said, I'm going to protect you. As long as you are going to keep my word, which is the Holy Bible, as long as you're going to emulate the Holy Word of God, which means obedience and sacrifice. And I said, all right. Yes, Lord, I can do that. I don't know how, but I'm going to do that. So now from the holy, that was a holy place. I'm in the tabernacle in this induced coma. So from the holy of the place, a holy of holies, I go to a really thick curtain within the tabernacle. There's this holy place. And from the holy place, I see all of these three things that I just talked about. And each of the th three things promised me what he wants me to do. It's like, no. What are you going to do, Lord, for me? No, it was like, no, no, you are going to do what I'm going to tell you. And he shows me. He's, he's, he's a God of mystery, always talking in mystery. But that's why reading the word of God is so important, because every day it's going to be different. Some days it's going to be mystery. So for me, that is what it was, the holy place. And from there, he takes me to this great partition. He takes me to the holy of holies now. And there's a huge curtain, a really thick, and I knew all about curtains because as a child, you know, we had these curtains, thermal curtains, curtains that would protect from heat, thermal curtain that would keep the house warm or cool in different seasons, la lavish. This curtain was extraordinarily thick. And I said, Lord, what is this? So wh where am I now? It seemed really heavy. It represented, he said, what, what and I asked, what did it represent? It represented the spiritual warfare that I was going to go through it. Obviously, because I was, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had to go through a spiritual warfare. But last but not the least, God himself said, you know what? You're going to go through tyranny, which is going to bring you to the fullness of the blessing that he has. The first thing that the truth of wilderness, and you're going to go through that wilderness. So that curtain depicted going through the wilderness, the spiritual warfare that I'm seeing it today in our country. And he says, I'm going to take you to that. He's going to teach me completely different things. And the, one of the most important thing was to teach me to be completely dependent upon him. And I want to thank God, Father God, for even that wilderness, because I've been through that. Then the last I'm going to take you to Philippians 4, 19, okay, and I'm going to read that. It says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's what it says. So what the Lord spoke to me, these were a couple of verses while I was in that tabernacle. He says that Jesus is going to do all things possible, mountain-moving power of faith, and I'm going to just have to do one thing. And I said, Lord, what am I going to do? He says, well, you're going to trust the Lord for supernatural results. Now, the transplant organ trafficking is a sophisticated and an extremely lucrative business, and it's real. And don't just think one moment that you will continue to live in a world of fairy tales and socialism cannot creep in. It's a nation's judicial nightmare. I just want to leave you with the Ten Commandments today, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to tell you what it reflects to me. To me, it reflects something that God out of created that out of his own character. And he called the people of Egypt because he loved them, therefore the Ten Commandments. But God can lead you and me into the fullness of blessing that he has for you today. And sometimes that wilderness experience is very important. But we as a nation, the great nation of the United States, we need to fight tyranny and overcome, and I'll tell you how. You have to overcome 
by emulating the Holy Word of God, the Holy Bible. The Bible is everything. It's a weapon. It is the two-edged sword, but you have to go out there with your entire full armor of God. So again, I just want to encourage you all again. The Word of God is powerful today. It was yesterday, and it's always going to be. It's been with me. I survived. If I wouldn't have survived, I wouldn't be here today to tell you about that. So we're going to move on together as one huge family in Michigan. And we're going, to, we're going to conquer, and we're going to fight tyranny, and we're going to keep our constitutional rights. God bless you. God bless Michigan. Amen. Thank you so much. All righty, a lot of passion here tonight. Thank God for it. All righty, um, Ron's going to come, and we thank God for the work that the Lord has done through Stand Up Michigan. It's been a bright light for months, and I thank God for the stand that they've taken, and we want to um, hear from him about the direction that Stand Up is going, and we want to then, I want to take a few moments when he's done, and and uh, we'll wrap this up, but I want to tell you what I believe God wants us to do here in this city, in this town. But before Ron comes, I will like to say that um, I appreciate everyone that's here tonight. Thank God that you took the time. But I will say that other than my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no one uh, is more important to me than my precious wife, Linda. And she is sitting back here. She's a saint, the mother of our 12 children beautiful and uh wifey would you stand please thank god for you You're awesome yes. she is amazing all right uh ron come and tell us if you would please uh what we have planned in the days to come thank you for your time we appreciate you being here let's give him a big hand so we heard a lot of things tonight haven't we I mean, we've gone some circles. We've been in circles, like I said, this last 15 months. But let me tell you, we've been, uh, from Stand Up Michigan and the leadership side, we have seen miracles happen. People that have come together, they've never known each other prior to any of this. And we started with a Facebook group that, as many of you know, that were parts of it, grew to over 400,000 people before we were wiped away in May, deleted because we were communicating with each other. We had made a determination literally in day one, and when I say the Lord spoke to me and talked to you about miracles. So we end up with uh, a, a Facebook group that started the day before at four in an afternoon, and the next afternoon, a deputy sheriff from our county comes to our home who, no, 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 this is good. The deputy, the deputy sheriff who comes to our home, our son is a deputy sheriff. He happens to work with her. She knows that my wife runs Facebook groups for our Arabian horse farm and also for a canine program for our police department and says so she has experience in social media help. By the way, Laura is the one running the table back there selling merchandise right now. So uh, she is, believe me, she's been not only with us, but she's been helping to run the admin and the moderation for many of these social media platforms since day one, every single day for the last 15 months, focusing on all the negativity, keeping everybody out that shouldn't be there and focusing on that. And believe me, that's a, that's a, that's a calling all by itself. That's right. So... On that day, they said to, they asked my wife if she'd be willing to help. Well, our business the day before that had been completely shut down because we were not considered essential. We manufacture displays for trade shows. I started this company 35 years ago, and if you can imagine what happened to trade shows, to conventions, to job fairs, to recruiting events, everything that we manufacture to be used to promote individuals, businesses, organizations, was no longer. Our business was dead, zero. And our employees were told, you can't come to work. So that's where I was. 
so I peeked over her shoulder and saw what was happening, and, and the Lord literally hit me just like that, that this organization, this Facebook group, can become an organization. But it's going to be up to which direction it chooses to go. And so I said, who is this person who started this Facebook group? And that was Garrett Saldana, the chiropractor out of Kalamazoo. And I said, would he be willing to take a phone call with me because I'd like to talk with him because my background in our business is in messaging. We take a corporation who has a message and has 100 salespeople and says, how do they take their message, disseminate it across the country with 150 salespeople in a consistent manner that they can get measurable results? It's much more difficult than you think because we've got 150 personalities that live in different parts of the country. So how do we get them to tell the story in the same way? That's my job. That's what I do. So I said, can I talk to him? And he said, yeah, I'd be willing to make a phone call. I ended up having a phone call with Garrett and said, uh, I think you've got something interesting here. I think this could be something special. I said, but it really is whether you're going to go in one direction or another. If you're going to be against something, Michiganders against excessive quarantine, I understand we're drawing people in, but you can't just be against something. You have to be for something. Are you willing to look at that? And he said, yeah, because honestly, I don't know what I'm doing. All I did was start this up to say, does everybody else or do other people feel the same way I do? That's all there was to it. And I said, well, I said, first of all, we've got to become an organization. I said, I think I can help with that. But more importantly, we need to connect with our leaders, meaning our House and Senate members. So a little bit more of my background. So I ran this business for 35 years. I live in a town called Nuego, Michigan. I didn't grow up there. I was born in Port Huron, so I'm from the east side. So I'm from more of a blue-collar background. He talked about bars. My grandfather owned a bar. It was called the Zebra Bar in Port Huron along the Black River. Uh, it was a bola, a bola drum, so it was a bowling center, and it also was a restaurant. My other grandfather owned a place called Hilger's Bar in Port Huron. Definitely blue collar, big third shift, opened at 9 in the morning, and had a whole group of people. Both of them owned these restaurants and these places for 50 years. I understand that's where I came from. It's where I grew up. My parents were divorced, and I ended up moving to the west side when I was a teenager. Grew up, started a business there. Went to college when I was in 16 years old. Had a year of college in when I was, when I was uh, before I graduated high school. And I went right into business because I believed that I had something special to offer and I didn't need to go to college for it. Imagine that. Kind of happens, doesn't it? So as this business grows, I realize I'm raising kids. I said my kids aren't going to travel like I was and be moved around the country. Instead, I wanted them to be able to be raised in a single community because I didn't have that opportunity. Nuego was a beautiful little town. It was a nice size school, class C school. So, you know, five, six hundred people in the high school. Everybody kind of knew everybody, but I had to get involved. So I helped coach baseball, coach football. I ran the racket football program, and I helped with our school system. But my business wasn't tied to our community, so I wasn't tied to people in that way. But the area was growing. This was, of course, probably in the 1990s, so it was, everything was growing in Michigan at that time. And uh, I was approached to help run a school bond issue because we were growing so much we had a lot of kids in portables. We hadn't passed a bond issue since 1964, and the bond issues were failing. They had failed twice already in our community. And I said, well, because my messaging's my background, and I'm not from here, and I'm not part of the school administration, I'll be willing to help, but you've got to understand and find out where the problems are. Why is this bond issue not passing? Guess where the problem was? In the school system itself. It was in the teachers themselves. It was in the people who supported it, the bus drivers, the people who were the cooks. Because guess what? The people who were looking to design new buildings weren't listening to them. They were planning it from up here. The people that were working were down here. And I said, the problem is internally. They said, it's impossible. They all say that they're supportive. They're all for this. I said, they're not all for this. Because I'm meeting with them individually, and I don't identify who they are, but I'm telling you, you have to listen to them in order to change it. It's about the people. Yes. Guess what? We passed the bond issue. A year later, they came to me and my office, a group of businessmen, and said, would you be willing to run for mayor? I'm not interested in politics. I have no background in politics, again, and, and, but I was working in the community. Now I helped with the bond issue in the community, and they said, here's the problem. The people that are on the city council right now are all considered crooks. 
I'll tell you why. Our city manager had embezzled almost $1.8 million through the city. Now, it, he had already left the city. It was found out through a divorce when his wife was on the stand and said, let me tell you what I know. But it turns out it didn't come from the city money. It was through projects that happened in the city, and there were projects, and he had created some dummy companies, so these were from grant money. But either way, nobody trusted anybody, and they asked me if I'd be willing to run, and I said, well, look, I'm not interested in politics. I'm not interested in getting involved. But if I am or if I do decide, then we're going to change this community. We had a downtown that the highway runs through. It was boarded up, just like all downtowns were in the late 1990s and 2000s. Everything was strip malls. Everything was new. But... All the downtown businesses were closed up. Bunch of real estate and antiques. Imagine that. Look around and see what you saw. So I uh, agreed to run for mayor, and I was elected, and I, I was going to serve two years and straighten it out, have them run their own budgets. We had a police department, a DPW department. We ran for our entire 50000 in the county, but our city ran all the infrastructure, everything from the school to, from schools to retail and everything was run in a very small part of the county. Everything else were lakes and surrounding areas. They enjoyed it all, but they didn't pay any taxes. That's where we were. So uh, one term turned into two, turned into three, and I ended up serving five terms as mayor. And, we, uh, and over the five terms, we completely redid our downtown. We got private investment. We leveraged it with grants. We had to get all in one of these 37 businesses in town, all 100% agree to give up their property at their back door. All 37 had to give up all their property at the back door in order for us to be able to redo, because guess what we had to do? We had to redo storm sewers. We had to redo everything. Well, guess what? You can't get grant money for private property. So they all had to be willing to give it up. That was a battle, but it was for the better good of the community, and we got it done. So we went through all of that. Through that process, I got to meet people that ran for House. I helped people get elected to the House. I helped people get elected to the Senate because they were involved in Lansing. They were involved in our local community. So when all this came about, I ended up, and I, so now I'm moving back forward. So now I've gone through that. I've been mayor. I've run economic development for our area for 25 years. And by the way, I just in January resigned from economic development as chair of our, of our TIFA, which is a, like a DDA, because I'm involved in Stanton, Michigan, and I don't have time. Now my business is beginning to start back, but it's a very small shell of what it was. And during this past 15 months, I have to this date not taken one dollar from Stanton, Michigan. I am also about a half a million dollars in the hole in my business from where I was then. Refinanced my home, refinanced my second home, refinanced my business, tapped out my line of credit while I have been fighting for the people. I don't say that because I'm asking for anything. I say that to say I am with a lot of the businesses here that have lost their business. I am with the people that literally tried to fight, and I did fight at every turn. Amen. And if more people had fought with me, I wouldn't be where I am today. And in many of the restaurants that are closed forever would never have been closed. Right. But we have choices to make. So Unlock Michigan was one of those choices. I said I knew the people. By the way, when we were shut down, the top pin post in the Stand Up Michigan group of 400,000 was the suicide hotline. We had had multiple suicides that happened on social media, with social media, saying my brother just killed himself in the basement. Those things happened on a regular basis. We didn't even know where these people were. It's just social media. Where are you? We can have somebody get with you. How do we contact? And that was when it hit me that we have to stop doing things from up here. We can reach people on social media. We all feel good about keyboard warriors. Boy, I wish I could. All these people are, you know, I mean, I, I hear it. I, you read it all. It's really easy on social media. When you're in front of somebody face to face, it's different. When you go to those restaurants that are closed and they're trying to keep their people hired, trying to feed the people in their community, trying to educate their kids when the school's closed, the single mothers who had to stay home because they couldn't go to work because they had to educate their kids at home. Nobody wanted to talk about it. They wouldn't let us talk about it. Social media wouldn't let us talk about it. Our governor certainly didn't want to talk about it. She was busy saving lives in the nursing homes. 
paying $5,000 a patient to the nursing homes to take positive COVID patients. And by the way, shipping them around into areas of our, of our state that had no positive COVID patients. Shipping them to counties that didn't have them. Guess what? They had them once they shipped them there. Because the masks don't help. It didn't, it didn't stop a single case ever. As it's explained, as you understand, that virus is the size of 4,000 times the head of a hair. It is like trying to use a chain link fence to stop mosquitoes. Try it. It does not work. It never has worked. This is about control. This is not about a virus. And when they began putting it on your children is when it really hit me that our organization has to change its tune and has to stop talking about things from here and start talking about things in every single community across the state. But what angers me is that too many of you and too many of the people in every community decided to consent and said, I will, if you'll just let my kid play football, he can wear a mask. We did it. Don't say no. We did it. People even from our side of the aisle said we will give up this freedom for this one. Are you tired yet? Are you sick of it yet is my question. In the beginning, what was it? It was, oh, it's a pause. We're going to save life again. I mean, we got to take care of Grandma. We just, we just, if, we just, if we just take it easy, just settle down a little bit, right? And then it became the next pause and the next pause. And the next thing you know, last summer, you could feel a little good about yourself until we went back to, well, no, we're not going back to school. No, the unions decided, no, we're going to pay you. We're going to keep home. We're going we're to make you find a way to educate your kids. The kids didn't learn anything. Tell me we care about the inner city kids in this state. But where I draw the line, it is your and my responsibility to take care of our children. We are it to protect our children. For God's sakes, take the masks off of our children. You listen to people like Dr. Avery Jackson. Does anybody know Dr. Avery Jackson from over here? An incredible man. A neurologist who has studied, and he's from right here in Michigan. You'll hear more of him soon. He talks about the depravity of oxygen in our children while their brains are developing. It is a long-term effect that our government simply does not care about. But you better care. And it is time for us to stand up. If you're not going to stand up for your own individual rights and liberties and for the Constitution, if you're not going to stand up for that, then at least stand up for your children because they cannot stand for themselves. Right. We're also doing these things and protecting these rights and liberties for them so that they have the opportunities and the freedoms that were afforded to you. We talk about people who served and sacrificed for our country from Vietnam to wherever it happens to be, in whatever theater that they were in, they defended and stood up for our country. And like I say, we talk about purging. They're purging people who are God-fearing, American liberty-minded people and trying to move them out of our military. And I just say that's just not going to happen. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I also know that we are and have been the silent majority. We are the majority. That's right. We are not as silent as we were. Amen. But we're just getting started. That's right. Amen. Now the reason, the reason it can't be seen or heard so easily is because social media won't allow it. We have to be careful. One of the articles that I read a couple of months ago was about self-censorship. And that is, I want to stay on Facebook, so I can't say this. I can't say that. I've got to find different terminology. I've got to be careful. I've got to be careful in my community. I don't want to offend people. I don't... And so we find ourselves moving around ways that which our mind never before dreamt we would be as a free country. That's right. You got it, brother. But it's like China and Russia and now Cuba. 
But guess who's exposing themselves? And what did we hear? We heard from people talking here about the fact that there are blinders over people. There are blinders over them. Uh, understand this fear that many people have is real. Our three pillars for Stand Up Michigan is to care and to inform and to activate. Care for people where they are. As Christian people, we have to accept people and speak to them about the Lord wherever they happen to be in their current walk, not where we expect them to be. That should be the same for the people that are around us in each community. It should also be the same, honestly, for our legislative leaders. And as it was mentioned, many of these people were, came from all walks of life and decided to serve. It doesn't mean they're medical experts. It doesn't mean that they're policy experts. It doesn't mean that they're budget experts. Shoot, when you meet a lot of them, they were what? They were a pig farmer. They were whatever their backgrounds were. Now, they get in there and then they follow leadership. Eesh, that's a bad word because we don't have a lot of that. So we talk about our, our parties. The Tea Party was a big, they always say Stand Up Michigan nationwide is being looked at as the closest thing to the Tea Party. And I say it's not anything like the Tea Party because the Tea Party was about, I don't like Republicans and Democrats, there needs to be a third party, we're going to take back our country. The problem is once those people were elected, they went down there and became part of the swap. And then the Tea Party as an organization got taken over by big business and big interest, and they became nothing, right? That's why we have to go back, and I know there are remnants of the Tea Party. There are patriot groups that have remained for a decade, but by the way, they're not growing. They never did grow. They've remained where they were, talking to themselves in an empty room. How many people here believe the election was stolen? Okay. We've got that settled. So, so, the, so the question I always have for every room is, why do we continue to get together in the same room and talk about it when we already all know what happened? Why do we not spend more time in this room talking about what we're going to do about it? Because you, I am sorry to say, cannot change Washington, D.C. It will not happen. You cannot change and I'm not talking about even the elected officials who can change those. But the swamp is much deeper than that. It is the International Monetary Fund. It is, the NF, uh, NF, it, it is everything from our own government, our FBI. It is the NSA. That's right. This is deeper than we could ever imagine. And they are lifelong people that are involved. And they, they, they serve and they live in that cesspool of D.C. And they're there representing Republican or Democrat to benefit themselves and their family. That's what they are. And I'm not saying it's all of them. It's not. We mentioned some very, very good people. But we also notice a lot of great people that are very, very silent right now. They're not defending those that showed up on January 6th. They're not defending those that right now are in solitary confinement and have not been charged with a crime. They're not told who shot Ashley Babbitt, which, by the way, as soon as something happened to George Floyd, we know everything that is supposed to be known about this officer. But we can't find out who shot her through the eye through a glass door when she didn't have a weapon. Still can't talk about it. I thought we could defend ourselves. Or I guess we're told we can't. So now social media has taken over. We can't advertise before the election. We can't talk about things after the election. You can't talk about election integrity. You can't talk about vaccines. You can't talk about masks. You can't talk about children. You literally are said, you can't talk about anything because it's our platforms, and so therefore, you will be silenced. And we will also deplatform like they did us. So we built back up during Unlock Michigan, 113,000 on a Facebook page and over 100,000 in a Facebook group that were doing nothing but sharing your stories. If you remember in Unlock Michigan, it was a picture of you getting your petitions, picture of you making your homemade signs, picture of children's with American flags. That was all that that was. And the day after the presidential election, at 11 p.m. at night, both of those were deleted by social media. Time number two. Deleted. No warning, no message, no response when we went back and said, we do not understand. And by the way, Stand Up Michigan's Facebook page created through an IP address and a group from Stand Up Michigan. 
Un Stand Up Michigan to Unlock Michigan's Facebook group created by a completely different platform, different IP address, nothing connected at all, but simultaneously within five minutes deleted together. Imagine that. It's called targeting. Because see, if they can separate us, and what were we doing at that time? Sharing messages about what happened last night. We went to bed with all these leads, and now it's evaporated. It isn't making sense. But see, if they could delete us and scatter us like the Tower of Babel, if we can't speak the same language, if we can't get together, then they can't figure this out. And by the time they all get back together and figure it out, they will have consented enough and we will have taken over. It's where we are today. So we pivoted as an organization and said we have to force people to get off of Facebook. We say it's like cocaine. Think about it. People cannot get off of it. They'll get off of it, they go back to it. Oh yeah, I can't quite delete that. My, my, my kids are on there, whatever it is. They just can't get off. When I say that, billions are on there. They just don't get off of it. You can offer them other platforms, but they just, oh well, I mean it costs me $3 a month to be on Locals. $3 a month, oh I can't pay. Why do I have to pay? Facebook isn't free, people. They have 5,000 points of you. They know everything about you. I say only God himself knows more about you than Facebook knows about you if you've ever been on it. And I defy you to show that different. They know what you do. They know what you looked at. They know you scroll. They know where you stop the scroll. And they have recorded every bit of it. And they've used it to identify you, to lead you into what they think you need to see or hear. And I'm telling you, eventually, you just have got to shut it off. But how are we going to change things? We're going to change things like this. But guess what? You're going to need a bigger building. You are. The next meeting is going to pack this room and that doors are going to be opened, I can promise you. Because we are here to take back Everything, but we got to take it back one community at a time. Now, what I say is, in the last few decades, we do not even know our neighbors. Our society's different. We have to get back to know our neighbors. When Unlock Michigan happened, we had people go, you know, I'm willing to stand up and put an unlock sign in my yard, but I don't think there's anybody else in my neighborhood who agrees with me, but I'm going to put my table out there. And guess what? They said, I couldn't believe it. There were four more Unlock Michigan signs. People from my neighborhood were stopping by and signing. I got to meet people I never knew before because guess what? There were more people that were like them than they ever understood, but they never communicated it. And so what I'm saying to you is just like now, how, what was your percentage of vote this, in the presidential election for Jackson County? I don't know the county. I know well, my township was um, 78%. 78%. Okay, so let's just use that as an example. So do we believe that 7.8 out of every 10 people you run into outside your door agreed with freedom and voted for freedom and voted, and I say voted for President Trump, but as President Trump told us the day before the election, we were in Grand Rapids with him the night before, he said, they are not coming after me, they're coming after you. I represent you, I represent your voice, but you are not voting for me, you're voting for freedom and liberty and self-control, right? That's what you're voting for. 78% of the people voted that way, but if you listen to the media, you'd think you're a minority. But we're not. We're not a minority. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. And the greatest thing that we have is that our Constitution is built upon principles that we can talk to people about and at the same time we're witnessing to them. Because that's what makes us different. It's built on biblical principles. The foundation. Is that not the key to everything? If you don't have a solid foundation, what do you have? And that foundation is immovable. They can tear down all the statues they want of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, and they can call them racist and anything they want, but it was never about the man. It was never about them as men, and they never claimed that it was. It was about, and that's why they instilled those principles and put that down on paper to make sure that those things would never change because God never changes, and he's never failed us. So what I would ask you... As these chapters, these are your chapters. All we are 
is an umbrella. And it's the reason we have organizations in here that, we rep- that, that already are meeting on different causes. What Stand Up Michigan is and needs to be is an umbrella over all of those things. The people that are interested in parents groups and unmasking our children and critical race theory and action civics and things within our school that we've been blinded to in curriculum for decades but we're now standing up for. We'll not only have the 10 people willing to show up and talk but we will have hundreds of us willing to show up and change the school systems and get those school boards and identify those people that need to be replaced. And we have to start in our school board, in our township boards, in our county commissions. That's how we change right. your neighborhood, your county, your community, your, and, and then we change our state and our country. Right. It isn't going to happen in Washington or in Lansing. Right. It's going to happen right here in every single community here. And so when we talk about Republican and Democrat, I'm going to give you a perfect analogy. We can go to Ottawa County. I hate to keep using them as an example, but it needs to be because Ottawa County is a hugely Republican area. They vote 60 some percent always. You cannot run as a Democrat. The primary is the election. You win the primary, you're elected. So what does that mean if you're a liberal? You run as a Republican. So we call them rhinos. They've run as Republicans, but just understand, I I hate the term because all it is is we've elected people that we don't know what they stand for. Now we've also had a lot of people that haven't run because you're not willing to serve. We're busy, I know, we're busy raising our families, educating our kids, volunteering in there, working in our church. So we just don't want to get involved in politics. We have got to get off of our butts and get involved. That's right. And we can never sit down again because the left doesn't sit down. Right. Win or lose, Sheriff David Clark at our uh, dinner in Detroit back in December last year said that the Democrats and the left are like ants. They never stop. You can pour water on them and you move them and they just move a different direction and come back again. What do we do? We win an election and we go there and we go, well, we finally did it. We won. Now we all need to work together. That's what we do. And then we work with the left and they, 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 they appease us for the next two years. They take it back and then they say, we don't need you. We don't need to hear from you. And we never learn the lesson. Because guess what? We had the Republican control, super majorities in the House and the Senate. We had Snyder. Oh, yeah, okay, we had Snyder, all right. Well, it still was better than Granholm, i got to tell you. But anyway, that's what we had. But just think of the things we could have done to protect our elections. What we could have done to give and protect our individual rights. But you know what? Our budgets, while we were in control of the Republicans, went from $40 billion to $65 billion. They all love spending. But with that spending always came control and demands of you as individuals in your own communities and your cities. And because our city councils are weak, and because our, our, our people, that are especially school boards, half the time they're run unopposed, for God's sake. These people have been there for decades. They don't even remember why they're there. <laughs> Laugh, but it's true. You go there, they don't get the agenda until they walk in the door, and they go, yep, that's what, that's what the superintendent says. That's what the union says. Right. Whatever it is, it's ridiculous. So we have to identify these people now. We have to call them out and say, do you stand for critical race theory taught in our schools? Yes or no? No. Do you stand for action civics? Yes or no? Are you going to take grants? Sorry about that. Are you going to take grants from the federal government in order to teach progressive things in our school system? By the way, Republicans in Washington have backed some of these bills because they didn't read them. And we've got House Republicans right now, and I don't usually name them, but there are individuals who I've asked questions to, and their answer was, well, they lit a cigar. And they said, I don't read the bills. That's my staff's job. Now, if I gave you their name, you would be like, whoa. But I can tell you there's more of those than you can imagine. And guess who these staff are? The staff are staff of this guy and the next guy elected. They're their staff too. They're the ones paid off. They're the ones who work for the swamp. And they're the ones who control the messaging. And so when you call and you say, I want to have a meeting, and they say, well, I'm going to have you meet with my staff, guess what? The person elected only gets back the information the staff member gives to them. I'm trying to explain to you how Lansing and how Washington works. They do not get the information. So when you do that, you say, no, 
I would don't mind meeting with your staff, but I want to meet with you and I want you to hear it from my mouth. I want you to read it here because I want to know from you what you have to say, not what your staff has to say. Right. Same thing with the legal advisors for the House and the Senate. I am telling you right now, Republican or Democrat, they are creatures of the swamp. They do not read their lawyers, but they don't read our Constitution, for God's sakes. They don't defend the Constitution. And our own governor and her administration is completely, does not care about the rule of law. As you saw, we'll do what we want, we'll rule by decree, we'll be tyrannical leaders, and we're going to do that until the courts tell us no, and then we're going to defy the courts until they tell us no, and then we're going to get to the Supreme Court, and then we're going to defy them, and then they're going to tell us again, and that's what happened, if you think about it, with the 1945 law. And then we go to the Board of Canvassers, and they have two Democrats who say, sorry, we think there needs to be an investigation. The Supreme Court comes back $100,000 later and says, I'm sorry, but you don't have that authority. And they have, well, there's another Democratic lawyer that thinks we should do some more, so we're still not going to vote for it. We're going to cancel our meeting. And so the Supreme Court comes back again last week and says, do you understand? No means no. Same thing they told the governor. No means no. This is a liberal, by the way, a four to three court, but they're coming back with seven zero decisions saying, do you realize how ridiculous this is? Which is why I'm now leaning towards us of saying, why do we continue to follow these guidelines? Guidelines, they're not laws. They're the requests of us. They're guidelines, and we continue to follow them. We're now organizing by county, and what I need you to do, because this is how your county, is you have to go to standupmichigan.com, and you're going to sign up which it identifies you by this county. That's going to allow, when you scroll to the bottom of your county, you will see Pastor Lang's information. You'll see an email address there for your county only. You'll see a phone number there for your county only and your leaders. Then you're going to have a map there. You're going to have a calendar there. They'll have calendars of events for all your organizations that are going on here so that you can support each other. Understand, we all have our causes, a 2A issue, right? We have a group that is pro-life. We have a group that's pro-gun. We have a group that's pro-education. But they're all fragmented. They're all multiplying and doing multiple things. They all have their own websites. They're all raising their own money. We want you to join in under one umbrella and help each other. Grow the organization as an overall so that we have more strength in numbers. Our opportunity and your opportunity happens with Unlock 2. Unlock 2, everybody know what that's going to be? Okay, we're going to take back the health department's ability to control our lives. We're going to limit the health department to the same 28 days that the other laws are. And it will be unenforceable period. They will go away and evaporate if they do not have the approval of the legislature or the governing body that governs them. And that, by the way, isn't just state health act. It is local health departments as well, so that we can't get liberal health departments in certain counties that would go, well, that might be the case there, but we're going to do this because the CDC says, or the who says, whoever the whoever they are. <laughs> by the way, they change their rules every week. So we are going to limit that. That's unlock two. Tell me that we are not going to get that done in a hurry with all the parents and people that, that voted for Biden, for God's sakes, in November, but then realized what it was now all of a sudden affecting them. That's what we see. It's now affecting them and their household. And so I say they have no idea the hive that they have shaken at this point. Now it's up to you what happens in this county. I'm going to be back here anytime you need me. I'm going to be an advisor, and we're going to be providing you with resources, resources like Leadership Institute. Through that course, they have offered to us through Stand Up Michigan and through all of your organizations free leadership training in any area that you have or need to have training. They have six-week courses that are online, on demand to run for school board. They have areas to run a campaign for you to, how do I raise money? How do I run a campaign as a whole? They have public speaking courses, all taught by people by Mark, Mark Levin, people, the incredible people that have offered resources through there, and these are going to be offered to you that you can put up here, not unlike you have, again, you had Professor Wagner, you can't get better than him. I mean, the man is, is a, a, a brilliant constitutionalist, Christian man, incredible lawyer, and a, a, just a great individual. And you've got him right here. You've got people like Amy Hawkins. Amy is going to be working on Unlock 2. 
We worked with her on Unlock One. She got to work with the administration or the people that are helping run the Unlock side. Understand Unlock is a campaign. That's all Unlock Michigan is. They raise money, they pay the legal bills, they do whatever. We're the brand, we're the army, it's just grassroots. That's it. We just said, we represent the people. The people will get this done, we'll put the word out, we'll communicate with them, they'll get the signs, they'll get the signatures and do it. So there are some interesting things we're looking to do here. I'm going to give you a little hint, a little thing. Those of you, how many of you helped circulate Unlock? Okay. How many of you signed Unlock? Okay. So what they're likely to do this time is going to potentially, they're trying to raise the money to ship a petition sheet to the home of every single person who signed that would be 380,000 homes. The idea behind this is if you just simply went and got your family, your church members, the people in your own county, understand, one sheet, one county, remember that, you, you can go get eight or ten signatures. Now, obviously, if everybody who got that got it done, we would have a lot of signatures. But the idea behind that is to kick that off, and then we're going to use our county chapters and areas as meeting points, drop-off points, pick-up points, and then we're going to have you all identify businesses in your communities that would also be willing to be signing locations so that we can roll this through. Because if we roll this through like we did the last one, we completely change the dynamic of our state because no longer do we need the, the, the governor to, to be able to approve anything. We can change any law, and guess what is coming next? Election integrity. Because we're going to get, first of all, we have to get the House and the Senate to pass some real integrity changes, up the bill, and let her veto it, and then we're going to put it on a petition initiative, and we're going to get that dang thing done. Because we want it done before 2022, not for 2024. And I think we get it, if we get it done in 80 days when we had no businesses open, we had no ball games, we had no, we, think about it, we had no schools that opened in the fall, and we got 540,000 signatures in 80 days, and you couldn't gather. How crazy is that? Now we can gather, and guess what? All of those people that did everything for let the kids let them play, all of those people that are involved in teacher, all those ones involved in health care, all those people who stood by and watched what happened with health care, uh, now all of a sudden being forced to get vaccinations, and they're going, whoa, whoa, now it's about me. This is different now. They have so overplayed their hand. The left has so overplayed their hand. That's right. So we need you to become leaders in this community. We need all of you not to leave here, and here's my analogy, and I know some of you might have heard this before. Last year you turned on the TV. I'm going to call it the TV. You turned on your computer and you saw me talk, and you were like, yep, I'm all for unlock and whatever it is. That's like I'm watching a football game at home. Great football game. You turn it off. You go back to grilling. It sounds good. That's what we did. Now you've come here. What happens when you come here? You're now in the stadium. It feels different. You're part of a team now. Right. When we get unlocked done, you go, look what we did. You talk about it in personal sense. It's like when your team plays. You put on the jersey. Yep, we're playing at noon today. What time do we play? It's because it's ownership. Stand Up Michigan is like that. It's ownership. It is you. You did unlock Michigan. It wasn't a campaign. It wasn't a name. Stand Up, Stand Up Michigan was just you. Now, we take it to the next level. So now, guess where you are? You're now in the stadium. You've taken ownership. I need you, every single one of you, in two places. Tonight, you're in the stadium. I need you on the field. Because you can watch on TV. You can come to the stadium. But if we don't have players on the field, you will never win. You can't cheer for us. You have to play with us. And what happens at your meetings moving forward as you establish committees is getting involved in the areas in which your expertise and God-given abilities are. That means you could be a quarterback, you could be a kicker, you could be special teams, you could be defense, but you need to get involved in the area that you are called by God to serve. And then you need to support the other areas because guess what? If the offense and the defense don't support each other or the guy can't kick a field goal, you're not going to win. Right. But all of us together have one amazing thing in common. Guess what that is? The Lord. 
And as I had somebody in my national call today, and by the way, again, I got to be with President Trump last Wednesday. How many of you knew that? So I was asked to fly in. He flew me in. We, uh, I was at the press conference with him last Wednesday when they announced the class action lawsuit against big tech. Stand Up Michigan is going to be a complainant in that lawsuit. Amen. And through that process, I got to meet a lot of his team, a lot of his legal team, a lot of his people that served in his administration. We had about an hour long lunch afterwards talking about everything from the past, what happened in the election, how naive he was to believe that the people around him were supporting him. Yes, indeed. But he has a plan, and he has a team around him. This team that has been created has stuck with him through this process. And here is an example of that. You remember all the leaks? It's like you talk to a foreign leader, and the phone calls leaked, and he was in there, and it was like, he was like, Where, how is this possible? Where does this come from? It's because there were people so close to him that were not for him. They were not for freedom and liberty. And so he's put this team together. I knew about what was happening three to four weeks ago, and so did about eight other people along with his entire team. And I'm talking about messaging, marketing, legal, whatever it is. And when we held that press conference, not a single leak to anyone happened. The claps that went on at that lunch, everyone was cheering at that lunch because they were shocked. Because how do you have not a buddy that like, hey, uh, he's going to be, it's going to be a lawsuit. Just get ready. I mean, how easy is that? You know, it's nothing wrong with that. It never happened. It tells you that he has found and identified the people he can trust. That is huge. And so I'm telling you, that lawsuit is going forward. We're going to identify and expose big tech. They're exposing themselves. Just like our legislators and the people who serve us are exposing themselves. Which means we have to identify them as who they are. We have to get them on record. And that's why we talk about, we want press releases with them on record saying they're going to defend things. We do need a forensic audit. Amen. I was on the phone this afternoon uh, before I came here, literally right before I came here with Jake Hoffman. Anybody know who Jake Hoffman is? Jake Hoffman is a head of election integrity for the state of Arizona. He is the Arizona House member. He got elected. If you look at any of the election integrity or election reform bills that are there, he's the number one sponsor there. He comes from a messaging background. He was just elected to the Arizona House, and he took over along with another group of conservatives. I knew Mark Fincham, you heard of Mark. Of course. Okay, so Mark is another one of the House members. Mark's focusing on election integrity, and these group of people have done some amazing things in Arizona, and Maricopa County, I can promise you, is going to expose some amazing things. The reason we're seeing things happen right now in Fulton, in Georgia, and in, in, and in Pennsylvania, and we're seeing the media and Tucker Carlson being able to talk specifically about things is they cannot hold this back any longer because it's true. Now, we don't know whether there was enough for 154,000 votes in Michigan or not. It, that honestly is irrelevant. We have to find out and identify where exactly this happened. And we have to find out, we know where it happened. We know how it happened. We know that it's been happening for decades in these counties. And when we have people like Christina Caramos talk about literally staring at ballots with both presidents marked and having the person say, I think they wanted to vote for Biden and shove it through the machine. I mean, it's vocal. They didn't even hide it. And I say there was as much of that as there was a Dominion machine. There was as much of printing ballots and running more ballots through than there were and what I call faceless voters, people who marked a ballot or they collected as they mailed all these postcards to homes that nobody lived in and filled them out and guess what, they backed trucks up to these ballot boxes paid for by none other than Zuckerberg and dumped them and filled them up and delivered them in the middle of the night. It happened in all of those counties all across this country. It was targeted. It was specific because they said to President Trump in 16, you might have won and shocked us, but it will never happen again. Why it was allowed to happen is there are many that run under the R banner that went right along with them. But we can change all that. We can change all of that, but it only can happen starting in every single community. I believed, and I'll leave you with this, I believed that the solution was going to come
from the church. I believed that last summer. It didn't happen. Many churches shut their doors. Think about this. Visualize it with me. They go to shut us down. The churches remain open. They're the one place we can go share our information. We can pray together. We can release the fear. And we can invite those that are fearful to come. And we can have a revival. We can find that the true answer, regardless of a virus, is here in an eternal life, not in this world. We can release a lot of the fear. When they shut down our schools, the churches, the schools, the churches say, that's fine, we'll educate them, bring them here. All across every community, we had every ability to educate our kids and those parents who hadn't educated kids. We have teachers who are Christians who could come in and we could be teaching them the Constitution. We could teach them about our, our Bible. We could teach them about civics and our history. And we could have done all of that and we did not. The opportunity isn't over, though. We can say to them, if you are going to be one of these school districts that's going to say you're going to be vaccinated or our five-year-olds are going to have masks on their faces, then you need to have hundreds of parents with their children showing up outside the building and saying, until you change the rules, our children aren't going in. Now we're all leaving, and we're going to the church where we're going to be educated. I'll tell you what's happening in North Carolina. North Carolina has had business owners who have donated buildings. Buildings that are being converted into schools and schools that are going to teach history. They're going to teach education and math and science and the Bible. And they're doing it boldly. At what point in time will we stop consenting? Because as soon as these unions know the pink slips come and the teachers are going out the back door, all of this will change. And right now, if they care about the people in the inner city, if they care about those that don't have food at home, they have to expect it and and, and they depend on their teachers. They look up to them for so much because they have so little. We can provide that solution because every inner city has churches. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 The answer is here. He's providing us because Satan right now, I'm telling you as I stand here, is hiding behind the mountain. He cannot show his face where God is present. The fear, he needs to stay there because we are going to hold down this fear because we know who is ultimately in control. I need you to get involved. However you came here, There were hundreds who didn't come here for whatever reason tonight. You have to bring more people. I don't care what their focus is. I don't care what their talent or gifts are. If we do not get involved and take back control of your own community, we cannot change our state or our country. We have to talk to our pastors, and if your pastor's doors are not open, and if they won't talk about freedom of religion and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly in their pulpit and behind their pulpit, you need to find another church. They are not speaking from the word. They're not speaking from the pulpit. Politics and religion have always been together. It's only our government who's attempted to separate it. And it is time for us. The rest of the world wants to come here because of our opportunity. And we simply want to give up our opportunity for some other thing. I don't even know what it is. Or maybe it's fear. They're going to take my license. They're going to take my business. They're going to shut my, you know, whatever it is. Understand, once they've taken everything, what do you have left? So why not claim that now? (laughs) Right? So it's up to you what happens in your chapter. We are simply saying there should be chapters in there and I want you to invite other organizations to become a part. I want you to get with every pastor and church and faith-based leader that you have. I want you to get with your business owners who have had to shut their door and had the business and had the state tell them when they can be opened, who can come in, how far they have to be apart, what they have to wear on their face and what time they have to close their building and if they don't, they're gonna come and take their so-called license. It's happened to every one of them. 
They need to be here. Every bar owner needs to be here and say together, because guess what? When we start marching together, everything will change. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Amen. We thank you for your time. Stand Up Michigan is you. But I believe that they have not seen anything like this in our state or in our country. Here's what I told our legislators. Just imagine if we had 500 people committed to change every single community come 2022. They have never had that. They pay for individuals to come, college-age kids to come, knock on doors and hand out pamphlets. They think it's the only way. Our GOP still thinks that's the only way to get anything done. And I said, give it up. Because how it's going to change is when your neighbor knocks on your door and says, do you care about your schools? Then here's the person I want you to vote for. Or you go to the door if you're going to run and say, I need you to support because here's what I'm going to do. Do you understand what they're teaching in school? When that happens, we change everything. we got to stop doing things the old way, and our GOP does things the old way. And we're telling them we are the army within our own communities to take control of our own communities. And ultimately, if you're not going to do what represents the people, then we're replacing you. And they know the grassroots is the solution. They know that we're coming. And believe me, before now, literally until two months ago, even after Unlock Michigan, which many of them were like, uh, you know, they don't believe it. They don't want to do it. It's just this noisy. Grassroots activism to them was noise. We will put up with you. We'll listen to you. And then we're going to do what we want. Now grassroots is showing up in every aspect of their life and affecting them. And they know they have to listen to us. But you also have to have good spokespeople. If you go to these places and you go there, what we're asking you to do is do positive things in your community as Stand Up Michigan. Help businesses recover. Do a Pay It Forward Friday. Do, do planting. Clean up a street. Clean up a river. Do things positively so that when you ask for something, you're respected in your community. You don't want to just show up and go, this is what I expect you to do. Understand, they're all elected there. Until you replace them, you're going to get what you get. So find out where they are. Run for office, take the training, let's change the boards, let's change our communities, and let's get that 78% of the people showing up together, and then we don't have to worry about the 28% that are the vocal minority who expects you to con consent to whatever it is their latest thing that we all need to consent to. So, all right? I appreciate all of you. Thank you for your time. Well, amen. It's been a great, um, it's been a great uh, list of speakers. I thank God for them. And I understand that the mind can absorb only as long as the seat can endure. <laughs> and I'm going to be brief. And I just want to share one thing with you. I got um, Arizona Audit today proved that roughly 168,000 on-demand ballots are very suspect. And they're gonna do, they're gonna do the canvas, canvassing in Arizona, and we need an Arizona-style full forensic audit. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. On the back of the program that you received when you came in has uh, ways for you to get in touch with us. There is Stand Up Michigan. You can get a hold of us uh, through that email address. There is the one for Jackson Patriot Group, and get involved in that. Sign up, get your name on the list. Pime has their email here. Email them, tell them you want to be on their list. Uh, Black Robe Regiment is for the pastors and churches that we in intend to stir up in this county. Pray Amen. November 7th through the 9th. We're bringing a Patriot preacher who was a two-term representative in the state of Oklahoma by the name of Pastor Dan Fisher of the Fairview Baptist Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. He is coming to town and we are going to have a boot camp. We're going to have a boot camp for preachers and church leaders. And then there is uh, the mandatory vaccine protest. And that is going to be this Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Allegiance Health Hospital here in Jackson. They are saying take the jab or lose your job, and we're going to say not, not happening. So we need to gather there at the hospital. I just have a quick word I want to share. I would thank God for you. I'm going to read for you in Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 19. The Bible says this. 
so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Join me in prayer. Lord, help us, we pray, to keep our eyes on you. Help us to be a part of that standard that you are raising up. The enemy has sure come in. Lord, we need you like never before. We acknowledge our weakness and our inability to move mountains, but you are a great God and we love you. And I just pray that you would uh, anoint each and every one of us for a role to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge before you for the land, that you would not destroy it. Help us to be that people, Lord. Who can I send? Who will go for us? Here am I, Lord. Send me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to talk to you about standing up here in Jackson County for our kickoff 2021. The enemy has come in like a flood. The Bible told us that that would happen. And sure enough, the day sure feels like it is here. And I believe that our ultimate enemy is Satan and that he is the God of this world and he is so entrenched in our land and we need to get involved if we are going to be able with God's help to save this republic because the Bible says that there is an undeniable spiritual component to saving the land. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the enemy is very well equipped and the enemy never sleeps. And our real battle is not against people. Our real battle is against the unseen forces of darkness that are entrenched in human power structures, including governments, including colleges, including multinational corporations like Coca-Cola and Delta and Henry Ford Health Systems and Google and Facebook and the mainstream media in Hollywood and on and on and on it goes. The devil is using these things in our country. And I propose to you that we will never be able to look at ourselves in the mirror if after we know what is going on and we understand that we're under attack on so many fronts that we sit back and do nothing. We will never be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and what will our children think of us when we hand them the chains of bondage. So why do we need to become a band of brothers and sisters for truth and for freedom in the American way? How, just think about how far we have fallen just in the last two years. We have been deluged by a flood of wickedness that is coming upon the land. The Bible says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, so then with this flood, why do we need to stand up and why do we need to fight? Is it because we have nothing better to do with our lives? Is it because we have all the time in the world to fritter away? Is it because we're bored stiff and don't have anything else to do? What has caused one of the greatest populist revolts of our lifetime? What has compelled us? Why are people so exercised nationwide and searching to align with friends and neighbors and getting involved in politics for the very first time like many of you in this room tonight? So why are people so bold and why are they so determined to do whatever it's going to take to save the future for generations that follow? Why are we going to give whatever it costs to spend whatever time it takes to go where we must go? to get way out of our comfort zones. Why are we going to do this? I'll name just a very few, and I will not belabor them because we heard many of them tonight. We've locked down our churches. We've locked down our schools. We've locked down our businesses. We've locked down our restaurants. We've locked down our hospitals. We've locked down our nursing homes. They have changed our way of life, and we are a different nation. They are forcing vaccinations upon us. Dr. Joseph Mercola, author of The Truth About COVID-19, said about the vaccine just two days ago, it is reprehensibly irresponsible, and it is one of the greatest mistakes in human history. That's why we're going to be involved. And it's never been proven safe. And we have the hospital in this town that says, get jabbed or lose your job. 
and they're masking us and they're false flags and uh, January 6th and the dubious origins of all of that. And now our nation's capital is locked down and guarded and we've had a, a nation that was stolen from us and they're teaching critical race theory and they're shoving it down our throats in our schools and in our colleges and our military. And even law enforcement officers have to uh, eat from that pig trough, amen? A complicit and a corrupt mainstream media, fake news, gaslighting, undiscerning, and un an uncurious nation. That is why we have to step up. That is why we must get involved. Untold damage to the sovereignty of our nation is being done every month through our unguarded southern border. They are allowing us to be destroyed, and there's going to be two million of them, they estimate, in 2021. Simply put, we are living under total and unbridled tyranny. That's why we need to get involved. And the Bible says the answer is the Spirit of the Lord. The enemy has come in like a flood. But the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against that enemy that's flooding our nation. And make no mistake about it. God does not do a, uh, if he doesn't do a heavenly intervention in this nation and do it soon, we are not going to save the republic. We're not going to do it by ourselves. We're not going to do it by our party or our political affiliation. So the scriptures are very clear. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. And if we don't cry out to our God and fall on our faces, we are going to lose this nation. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You know, my Bible says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And if Republicans won't do the job, our God is able to use a radical Democrat. And they may think they're doing what they want to do, but our God's able to take what they're doing. He's able to turn it around and make it for our good. We serve a powerful God. And if we don't get a hold of him and beg him to help us in this fight, we're going to lose. I can guarantee you, it's the Spirit of the Lord, and he's the only hope that we have here's the kicker and I would guess some have never heard this verse or known why our nation's going to hell and our nation is going to hell the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God yeah. Psalm 9 17 we have forgotten we've gotten too big for our britches we forgot who butters our bread we've forgotten who feeds us and clothes us we've forgotten our God we've forgotten how God was the sovereign designer of our course from the old world to these pleasant shores we've forgotten the one who has blessed us and protected us we have forgotten the one who created us in his image we have forgotten to thank him we've forgotten to acknowledge him we've forgotten to honor him we've forgotten to obey him to love him with all of our hearts all of our minds, all of our souls, and all of our strength, and to support his work, and to tell others in this nation about his redeeming love and his saving grace. We've forgotten to train up our children in the ways of the Lord, and don't think for one second that any grassroots movement apart from the Lord God Almighty is going to keep our city and is going to keep our republic. And if we do not include him in our hearts and in our lives and in our efforts, if we do not humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, we are going to lose everything that we hold dear. You can mark that down and take that to the bank. We don't have a prayer without the Lord. We have no hope to turn this nation back to God without the Lord. If we turn to the Lord, the Bible says he'll hear from heaven. The Bible says he'll forgive our sins. And the Bible says he will heal our land. And that's exactly what we want. And we need to ask ourselves, are we on God's side? Are we on God's side? We need to ask a different question. Is God on our side? He wants to be. But we must do justice. We must love mercy. We must walk humbly with our God. And then we have the promise that he'll lift up a standard against the enemy that has come upon our land. And that's how, that standard is a banner. A standard could be a flag that flies over an army. 
We need every banner that we can to join us in the fight for survival. Whether you're flying the flag of your local church banner, we need your help. Whether you're flying the flag of Stand Up Michigan, we need your help. Whether you're flying the flag of the Jackson Area Patriot banner, we need your help. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you love God and country, we need your help. If you fly the banner of election integrity, we need your help. And if you're flying the flag of a veteran, we need your help. If you're flying the flag of Unlock Michigan, we need your help. If you fly the flag of a pro-life banner, we need your help. If you fly the flag of a Second Amendment banner, we need your help. If you fly a local politician's banner and you'll stand up for a constitution for what's right, you'll help uphold your oath of office and you'll love this country, we need your help. We need your help. If you're a patriot candidate for office, we need your help. Or if you're going to fly the banner not mentioned, we need your help. And if you love God and love country and love freedom more than life, we need your help. Yeah. If you want to restore the republic, we need your help. If you long to see a spiritual great awakening where this country lives by God's moral standards, again, join us and pray it down and give your life and serve the Lord. We need your help. So here's what we need to do. We need to walk and chew gum. We need to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to do not anything less for God, but we need to do more for our country. Not everyone can be focused on the stolen election, but I guarantee you I am. It eats my lunch and scrambles my eggs every single day. It's the, it's the main thing I care about. Nothing forward thinking is going to matter one whit if we don't find out what happened when they stole our country. They stole our country. They didn't just steal an election. They stole America. And they gave us a communist in the White House. So we need some people that are going to get with it on the stolen election. And we need people preparing to run for office that love God and aren't going to be bullied. And they are going to stand. We need some Washingtons and Jeffersons of our generation. We need some Samuel Adams of our day. We need some people that will stand up now in our day without fear. Uh, only the fear of the Lord. And we'll do right. And we'll, uh, we'll love God and honor the Lord. Oh, how we need them. You need to follow your passion. You, whatever God's laying on your heart, follow your passion. Attend those school board meetings and be radical. Amen? And stand up. Form township teams and join the conservatives in the city. Uh, join a dinner and go to the county commission meeting. Become a precinct delegate. Run for a local office. Get back in church. Get back in church. Get in the house of God. And if you're not a churchgoer, that's past. You need God. And we need God in this country. Get into the house of God. Get back to your Bible. Get back on your knees. Listen, I'm passionate about my church family. I'm passionate about the times that we live in. I'm passionate about engaging pastors and churches to enlist in this fight and to help us by calling attention to bringing back the Black Robe Regiment of the 1700s. Those were patriotic preachers who blazed the trails of freedom and, uh, and stood against uh, tyranny, and nobody knows their name. We want their names to be known. We want to bring a history course. We want to stir the pastors of this generation. We want to challenge them to be like our forebears who preach liberty and freedom in their pulpits. Oh, how we need the men of God who are not afraid at all. I am convinced, and what God has laid on my heart is we have the greatest untapped group of red-blooded patriotic Americans that exist in America, and they're sitting in our pews, and they're not engaged. They're not engaged. The greatest need of our generation is for the servants of the Lord to cry from the pulpit that this country is on fire. It is on fire. We need to pour that. We need to put that fire out. Our country is burning. So here's what you do. You sign up for the emails about Stand Up Michigan. 
Jackson County, you sign up for uh, the local Patriot emails, you get involved in the local GOP and support true Patriot incumbents, and we have some, and some new candidates that God is going to raise up. And do not support those who do not support us in Lansing. Do not support those who do not support us locally. Get involved somewhere. Do something. Talk to these grassroots uh, leaders among us and get a belly full of the destruction of our nation and refuse to sit by and let others face the giants while we sit home or we cower in fear. You need to do something. Everybody needs to do something. It's going to take everybody. You need to stand up. You need to stand up and you need to do something or we're going to lose this nation. And I understand that none of us has extra time. Nobody has extra money. Nobody has got time to do this. But we must do this at all costs, at all hazards. We need to reclaim and assert our rightful place as we the people. This is our country and we're taking it back by the grace of God. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I appreciate that. You may be seated. Thank you. I want to give you a couple quotes from Rinaldus Magnus and we'll close. Rinaldus Magnus, the 40th president of the United States, says freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in a bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. President Reagan said, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. This is your destiny. God's called your name. We will preserve for our children, this, the last best hope of man on earth. Or we will sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. If we fail, at least let our children and our children's children say of us, we justified our brief moment here. We did all that could be done. May it be said, we did all that could be done. Freedom is Rinaldus Magnus said, freedom is one of the deepest and noblest aspirations of the human spirit. He said, no arsenal is so formidable as the will and moral courage of, of free men and women. And he said, people don't stop, start wars, governments do. Yeah. He said this, and I'll close, the ultimate determinant in the struggle now going on for the world will not be bombs and rockets, but a test of wills and ideas a trial of spiritual resolve, the values we hold, the beliefs we cherish, and the ideals to which we are dedicated. May it be so. Let's just bow our heads for a moment and seek our God. And let's ask him for his help. Let's cry out to him for help. And I would like to ask you this one thing. Would you just do that? Take a moment and ask God to help us. Ask God to help us, to have mercy on us to forgive us our, our wicked sins, and to heal this land. And I want to just say this. If you do not know that you're going to heaven when you die, you need Jesus Christ. He died in your place. He shed his blood. He gave his life so that you can go to heaven. And he took your punishment. He took your hell. He took your the payment you deserve to pay, but he took it and he offers you eternal life in its place by grace because we're all a bunch of sinners. Each and every one of us are wicked and deserve hell, but my God allowed his son to come into this world to bleed on an old rugged cross to pay the redemption for my lost, wretched soul. And on November 2nd, 1978, I said a simple prayer when I acknowledged my sin before God believed in Jesus Christ who died on the cross. I just said a very simple prayer like this. Dear Jesus, and you could join me. I believed that he died in my place and they shared the gospel with me and I prayed a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. Please come into my heart and save my soul. I'm trusting you right now is my only hope for heaven. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Please come into my heart right now and save my soul. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder if there's anybody here. I'm not going to embarrass you. 
But I'd like to know, is there anybody in the house tonight trusting Jesus this very moment as your Lord and Savior? You just ask him to forgive you and come into your heart. Anybody at all tonight ask Jesus in your heart? Would you raise your hand? No one's going to look around. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. You may lower it. Yes, God bless you. Are there others? You're not ashamed. No one's looking around. No, no, your neighbors aren't looking at you. I just asked Jesus to come into my heart to save my soul. Anybody else? Heavenly Father, we love you. We owe you our lives. We owe you everything. You are so gracious. Thank you for the men and women who've come. Thank you for this place. Lord, raise us up to be a standard against the enemy that's flooded our land. They're everywhere. Give us boldness by thy Holy Spirit. Get glory and honor through our lives. May Christ be reflected in the way we approach this. Help us to be Christ-like, but help us to be bold as lions. And we'll thank and praise you for what happens in the days ahead. We are desperate. We have nowhere else to turn. We can't do this alone. We can't do this at all if you don't help us. So please save the republic for future generations until Jesus comes again so that we could teach our children about your saving grace. We love you, Lord. We just ask that you do something to save America and bring America back to you in repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You've been most kind. It's been very, it's, the hour is late. The hour is so late. <laughs> amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One thing, we're going to be dismissed. I want... As we're dismissed, I want Dr. Lee Tarver, if she would just say, whatever God lays on your heart, just, just speak a word, and then I'll close in prayer. Why don't you come up here, sister? Why don't you come up here? You come. <laughs> Amen. This is so exciting, isn't it? The Spirit of the Lord is here. If you have your Bibles, please join me in turning to Psalm 94 and 16. Psalm 94 and 16. Pastor, do you have that? I do. Do you have it on your phone? Get it on your phone. This is a, it'll bless, it blessed me. Oh, yeah, come on now. Come on now. Come, come on, on now. come on now. There you go. Let me use yeah. your Bible. Right there, Amen. Right there. Hallelujah. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? And who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Amen. Will that be you? Amen. Will that be you? Who will stand up? against who will stand up I'm who will stand up will that be you stand up michigan stand up who will stand up who will speak for the lord who will do that amen you are standing up stand up michigan is in the word of god the word of god says who will stand up against wickedness and evildoers and that is what the Lord said, Psalm 94 and 16. I want you to read that. I want you to believe that word. The Lord has called you for this time. And Esther, I have a book called Died in the Wool. Thank you, Pastor. And in the book of Died in the Wool, we, we quote the scripture for such a time as this. Right. But don't get it twisted. Mordecai told the servant to send the message back to Esther. Esther at first said, nope, it's too big for me. I can't do the stand-up. Right. I can't do this. I can't do it. That's right. That's right. Who am I? That's right. 
And he said three things to her, not just the one for such a time as this. He said three things to her. He said, the Lord is going to deliver his people with you or without you. That's the first thing he said. And the second thing he said, because you live in Jackson, doesn't mean that you are exempt from what is going on in this world. Because you live in a place of comfort. You, have, you and your family will not escape what is coming. That's right. But how do you know that you have not come to this place for such a time as this? Amen. You have been coming to this place for this time. And the Lord will deliver his people with you or without you. But he wants to use you. He wants to use you. Because no matter where you live on a farm now, because obviously real people on a farm don't, can't get kinkos, but because you live on a farm, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you live in the inner city. It doesn't matter. Because what is going on in our country, in our state, affects all of us. And you and your family are not exempt. But you have been called to this place for such a time as this. And walk in that, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All righty. Here's the blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brother Glenn. Brother Glenn, this, this man's my, one of my heroes. I want him to lead us in prayer. Brother Glenn, pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for this good group yes. of folk here tonight. Thank you, Father, that we can take a stand and lift up a standard against the wicked. Yes. And dear God, help each and every one of us here yes. to make that decision for you. Thank you for those that trusted you tonight. Yes. Bless us as we leave now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.